Welcome, everyone. It's time for our completely free Azure Solution Architect Expert Training. It's free Azure training, and it's our AZ305 free Azure course. And we're going to make this the absolute most fun, best learning experience we can do for you because we want you all to get nothing else, cloud hired, because that's why we do everything we do. We don't just do things for the point of a piece of paper. Everything we do is about getting you all cloud hired. And this is going to be a fun week. My team has come together and we have spent a couple of months on bringing some really excellent Azure Solutions Architect expert training for you to you completely free. And we're super excited about it. In this week, we'll cover the AZ305 exam. You know, this is Microsoft Azure certification. We're going to do Microsoft Azure Solution Architect training. And this is free Azure training. And the whole point is to get you past that AZ305 exam, but also to help build your absolute cloud knowledge so you can get cloud hired. Now, there's going to be a lot of free things we're going to announce this week, and there's going to be so many great things we're going to do to help you build your cloud architect career. I'd ask you to share the experience and share the free training with others. You know, we do this training because we know many people out there can't really afford, you know, a high quality boot camp where you can attend class and ask questions that get answered. And for that reason, it's so important for us to do this, to assist the cloud computing community, a community that I love, a community that I've been part of since 1996 when the first cloud I worked on was Frame Relay. And the next cloud I worked on was a 1998 called ATM. And the next cloud I worked on was the BGP cloud around 2000. And in 2001, I started working on the VPLS cloud and now modern cloud. So I love cloud computing. I've been in this thing forever as an architect, and I want to help you all get cloud hired and learn the cloud, so that's why we do these things. So please help us share the word of the free message. Take a second. Please send a tweet. Make a Click LinkedIn post with a link to this training session. Email your friends. Make a Facebook post. Post it. Please invite others to share in this week of free training. We want to help as many people get hired as possible, so please, please, please sign up. Tell your friends to join us now. I'd love to see 10,000 people, 100,000 people on this thing. So make a quick post and tell others, invite others to join you here, please. Now, after we do that, because we want to make sure everybody gets free training, here are some great free things I'm going to invite you to right now. I want you to sign up for the Azure Lab. See, we train our students a certain way. Nobody doesn't get hired because they don't know how to configure something. They don't get hired because they don't understand how something works. The concepts of how, what, where, how to architect it, how to design it. So in our class, we're going to have fun. We're going to talk about concepts, concepts, concepts. And for you to do the labs and get your practice, you can download our labs completely free from our site and work on them at your own time because I want to get you guys to get some great hands-on experience too. But I want to make sure that you all know something, that you all learn something, that you become great solution architects. And part of that is design, and design is all about knowing how it works. So we're going to make this lots and lots of fun, we're going to try and make it so deep. So please download the completely free Azure Lab demos. My team will be posting that in the chat box, the team with the blue raspberries. Guess what we're also going to be doing? Because we know that the cloud is a virtual network and a data center, and we know that it's critical to understand networking, specifically subnetting, supernetting, route aggregation, and BGP. We're going to run a completely free two more sessions. You only need to sign up for one. My team will post the sign up. Sign up for the subnetting workshop, and you'll get notified about the subnetting workshop and the BGP workshop. And let's face it, I have 10,000 hours of BGP knowledge. I'm one of the original Cisco certified internet experts. Back when it was an extremely hard two-day exam, my CCI number is 7417, so there are only 6,400 before me. And I worked at Cisco. I worked at all these tech companies. I've been designing networks forever. So when we do a BGP class or a subnetting class, we taught it at the biggest tech companies ourselves. So it's training that thousands have been through, thousands of network engineers, and we're going to give that from the cloud perspective to give you extra preparation. And again, it's going to be completely free. So we want to help you. Now tonight, all of you, please sign up. Please sign up. Our usual Head in the Cloud show is going to be a little different tonight. We talk on a 20-year-old person about in last October. His name is Daniel Bosu. 
He came to us, never worked in tech in his life. He came to us with, you know, the goal and a dream to succeed. And I am really honored to tell you that he is now a cloud architect at one of the world's biggest banks with a great job. And he's going to talk to you tonight about his journey, about how he came to us, what he did with us, and how he's hired as a cloud architect at 21 years old. He just turned 21 a couple of days ago, and now he's hired as a cloud architect for one of the biggest banks. And those banks are the hardest jobs to get. So we're going to talk about him and what it takes, his mental fortitude, what was in his heart, the things that he studied versus the things that other people study and why he's successful. So you can all get cloud hired because I want everybody to get cloud hired. And in addition to that, one more free things to get you hired. On this Thursday, join us for our completely free How to Get Your First Cloud Job webinar. And I got to tell you, people come from all over the world. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. I will tell you the following. How to show hiring managers the experience you've had through your life or other jobs is relevant to your new job. I will tell you exactly what the hiring managers want in the job. We will cover the rel exactly what we do, which is kind of misconfused to many people. So you're going to know exactly what to do so you can get cloud hired, because I want you all getting cloud hired. We'll talk about how to optimize your resume. So two things happen. It gets noticed. And we'll teach you how to get past the HR people that don't want you when you have an experience, don't have experience, and teach you how to go straight to the hiring manager so you can get cloud hired. All of those things are free. So we're going to get to the training right around now. But please, if you have a chance, go notify others. Join you on this free training. Make a quick 30-second LinkedIn post, Facebook post, tweet, send an email. Hey, join me. We do free training for a reason because we want to get the world cloud hired. Now in the chat box, before we get started, if you can give me a hashtag cloud hired, a hashtag cloud architect, or cloud engineer, whichever you desire to be, so I know who you guys are and what you want to be, and tell me where you're from, and then we'll begin. And we'll have lots and lots of fun. The format of today, while I'm waiting for you guys to tell me these things, is going to be as follows. We'll talk for about 20 minutes. And, and then what we're going to do after that is approximately 10 minutes of questions and answers. Because I want to make sure that you all know what's going on. And that's why we do questions and answers. Because what we want to do here is make sure that you get a great training experience just like you would in the class. Khalid, Saeed, thank you so much. I am so happy that you are here. I'm starting to see, I'm seeing some Utah, I'm seeing some Raleigh, I'm seeing some New York, Nigeria, Maryland. This is fantastic. I'm seeing Ghana, Kenya. I love it. I love to see so many people from all over the world. Florida, like me, Zurich, India, California, fantastic. More Nigeria, more Germany. It doesn't get any better than this. Cameroon, Israel from Nigeria. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, uh, India, Philadelphia. I actually grew up in Philadelphia, Houston, Asheville, North Carolina. Wow. London, South Africa, Tanzania, the Philippines, Florida, India, Nigeria. Wow. Hyper bad. I'm watching this from Sri Lanka. From there. Oh, this is fantastic. Parasil, Poon, India, South Africa. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it when I see people come in from all over the world. So please hit the like button. Please subscribe. Tell your friends, and we're going to get started with Azure Trading, Azure Trading, Azure Trading. So we're going to begin by discussing Azure Trading, by talking about the Azure Cloud and how it's organized, everybody. And for those of you that are new to cloud computing, this will be new. For those of you that are used to networking and data center technologies, guess what? Well, much of this will be a review. And if you're used to other clouds, such as AWS or Google, Guess what? It's all going to feel very similar because guess what? A cloud's a cloud's a cloud's a cloud's a cloud. And what's a cloud really? Nothing more than a network and a data center that's been virtualized. So let's have some fun and let's talk about the Azure cloud. So in the Azure cloud, we realistically have four things that we need to talk about. We're going to discuss regions, which are basically huge geographic areas, like a continent or part of a continent. We're going to discuss data centers, which are availability zones, which are nothing more than a data center inside of this giant geographic region. We're going to talk about edge zones, and edge zones are going to be edge computing, and we're going to talk more about that. And then we're going to talk about an actual point of presence, which is the best term for a content delivery network, what it works, and how they work. So we're going to have some fun here. 
So let's get techie. So let's first look at the Azure Cloud and how it's organized. What you can see here is we've got this large blue box. This blue box I like to view as a huge geographic region, like a continent or part of a continent. That's the region. So big geographic area. Now, let's say you were going to take half of a continent and fill it with computers. You're going to put your computers in more than one spot, right? You're going to put your computers in special buildings. Now, buildings that are designed to hold computers are called data centers. What's so special about a data center? A data center is a climate-controlled place where you put your computers. The data center has two sets of power coming in so they don't get power failures. They have two sets of generators coming in so if two power companies failed, the company can stay up and provide power to its system. There's battery backups. What exists in these data centers? Big networks, which means routers and switches and copper and fiber optic cabling. Racks filled with computers, which are basically a server. Racks filled with storage. Racks filled with load balancers. Racks filled with firewalls, IDS, IPS systems, etc. And guess what? It's all the stuff that's in the cloud. And that's what we're going to be talking about this whole time. Networking and data center technologies, which are cloud computing. So now that you can see it, big geographic region is big geographic region. Azure region. Data center per region is an availability zone. So availability zone is just a data center inside of a region. And now you know how simple those concepts actually really are. Now, I want you to think about this. If all your computing is inside of your building, like the traditional environment, it's going to be fast, 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 because you're there. But when you go to the cloud computing environment, the cloud provider may be 1,000 kilometers or 2,000 kilometers away from you. And with modern networking, that's okay. But, and here's the big but, it takes time to go from you to the cloud. And that's called latency. And depending upon your business, that latency may be tolerable or not tolerable. And we'll talk more about latency throughout this week. It's going to be fun. But the point is, is if you're in a business where a nanosecond is a competitive advantage, and in certain finance cases it is, and it takes you three milliseconds to get to the cloud, whoa, that's a problem because it's latency. So there are times where an organization will have to run certain computing workloads in their data center or in a data center that's close to their data center that's not so far away from the cloud. Think of it this way. If you've got your building and you could connect to a place that's 50 kilometers away, and then we'd put your fast computing there and then connect to another facility that's 2,000 kilometers away to put your non-performance-based computing, it all works and it gets closer to the natural data center performance. So that's what we're going to be talking about with edge zones. And Azure Edge Zone is a place, it's a midpoint for you to put your computer and your computing power in between you and the zone. So let me show you how we graphically represented it. So in a traditional environment, your power is here in your data center. And realistically speaking, we usually put most of our compute power in the cloud. But the distance from the data center to the cloud can be really long in terms of latency, and some applications may not be tolerant about it. So what the Azure Edge Zone is, it's a data center that's positioned in major cities closer to the users. So you connect to the edge zone and then back, it's back called to the Azure cloud. And that way you've got high performance local computing and cheaper long distance cloud computing. So what we're trying to do here is get closer to the data center again, data center like performance. So now you're familiar with some of the edge zones. Let me show you a little more of a graphical representation so you can see it. So you've got your region, this big giant geographic area. And inside of that region, you've got your data centers called availability zone. But there's these other data centers called edge zones, which are going to be closer to you in major cities, closer to your businesses. And by doing that, the computing power can get much closer to the edge zone, which really can deliver a much, much better experience for the user. That's called Azure Edge Zone. So let's talk about it real fast. What have we covered? 
regions, large geographic area, availability zones, data centers in those availability areas, edge zones, edge computing, much closer to the user. And guess what's next? Guess what's next? Points of presence. So what is a point of presence? Well, I'm going to give you the textbook definition of a point of presence, and then I'm going to show you why Azure so aptly named their content delivery network a point of presence. So there's that. So let's talk about what is a point of presence. In the networking world, we have internet service providers that all connect to each other. So in the U.S., we've got a lot of them, but we've got Verizon. It's a major carrier. We've got CenturyLink, which is a major carrier. We have 18, we have uh, eight Horizon and AT&T. We've got Comcast. There's a big Japanese telco called NTT, which has got a huge presence here, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of internet service providers. And the way the internet works is if you're hosted on NTT and I'm hosted on AT&T and I need to go to your website, I may go through my AT&T network, through a Verizon network, and through an NTT network, and that's how it works. So how do the internet service providers talk to each other? Well, they could have connections to each other all over the place, which they do, or could do, or what they could do is have something called the point of presence. Have a giant building in Miami, Florida, where all the internet service providers have high-speed connections, and all you gotta do there is connect your switches with a simple cable, which is exactly what a point of presence is. So now think about this. You've got a building with the world's biggest internet service providers with the highest speed internet connections in the world. That's called a point of presence. And now Azure decides to put its content delivery network in one of these point of presence. So a user needs to jump onto a content delivery network. And I'll give you a brief overview of it now. And we'll get into much greater details when we talk about the Azure content delivery options, network options, which are huge and plentiful, which are awesome. But let's talk about that. Let's think about this. If you can put your caching servers directly in the building with the world's fastest ISPs, then as soon as somebody hits your cache, they can go straight onto the right internet service provider and get really good routing. So it can make things cheaper. So an Azure point of presence location is where they provide access to the Azure Content Delivery Network. And content delivery networks are out there too improve performance, reduce latency, and improve the scalability and security of web applications. Effectively, they bring the content close to the user, and we will spend so much more time talking about this soon. But not today, because we're just introducing the content. So let's now look at the architecture of the, of the Azure Cloud. And we can see we've got this big, giant area called the region got these data center things, which are filled with computers and servers and load balancers and storage called availability zones. And now we've got these point of presence locations. And this is where your big ISPs are and they're bundled in areas. So that's a point of presence location. So now let's talk about how the content delivery networks actually work and how they help the customer. And again, we're, this is just a brief overview. We will get to this in depth, but not right now. So let's talk about the way it actually works just so you, to give you a guidance and we'll get much more to this later. So let's say I have a user. A user is in, the, the user is wearing a blue shirt, orange tie. That user wants to go to this really cool website called www.gocloudcareers.com. The user wants to become a cloud architect. So he goes to this really cool website. And the way a, the content delivery network is as follows. The user in the blue tie says, I want to go to www.gocloudcareers.com. He puts that into his browser. His system does the DNS lookup. It then finds the IP address for the website. And then it then sends it to what it thinks is the website. Now, realistically speaking, here's what's actually going on. When it leaves what it thinks is the website, it hits the Azure Point of Presence location. Now, if someone before this user went to the Go Cloud Careers website, the Azure point of presence would return it right back to the user instantly because it would be cached on there. And we'll talk about much more about caching and content delivery networks throughout the week, but just keep that in the back of your mind. Now, if the user in the orange tie goes to www.gocloudcareers.com 
and it's not on the cache or the content delivery network, what will happen is the user will hit the cache. The cache will go all the way through a private network back to the, sto to the initial location, whether it be on object storage like Blob or whether it be hosted on an Azure virtual machine, whatever the case will be. The web servers will respond and they will pop it on the cache and it will be stored on this Azure point of presence location. Then five minutes later, this guy says, I want to get cloud hired. So he signs up for that go the cloud architect career development program and he signs up. And then this guy tells his buddy, hey, do you want to join me on this class? And they both live in the same city. So now his buddy goes to the content delivery network and requests www.gocloudcareers.com and it's cached on this point of presence location and sent back to the server. So now you've got it. That is why we've got these concepts and what they are. So let's go through them one more time because I want to make sure everybody understands them. A region is a very large geographic area. An availability zone is a data center. An edge zone is where you push edge computing content closer to the user. And a point of presence location does the following. It's where you put your content delivery network. And now you get it. That is the basic layout of the Azure Cloud. Now we're gonna get into the Azure Virtual Network next, but I think now's the place to take about five to 10 minutes of questions from the audience to make sure that you guys are all caught up. While we're at it, um, let's see if anybody has any questions for approximately five to 10 minutes. If possible, can you compare with AWS and then when required, correlate with someone that known cloud company? Now I, got, I want you to think differently. I want you to learn the cloud and not a cloud. So if I want you to know what a virtual machine is, because if you know what a virtual machine is, just think about it this way. If it's an Azure virtual machine, if it's a Google Compute Engine instance, it's if it's an AWS EC2 instance or an Oracle virtual machine or a virtual VMware ESXi virtual machine or a KVM virtual machine or a Zen virtual machine, it's the same tech. So generally speaking, I want you to learn the tech. I don't want you to learn AWS and then try and translate it into your head. It's never gonna translate accurately. So sure, our team can make tables, but I want you to learn the tech and we're gonna cover actually the tech. I don't want you getting bombarded and worried about names of tech. I want you to understand what is the tech and how does the tech work? And then you can work in any cloud, anywhere, anytime. So there's that. Data center and availability zone. Go pal, they are identical technologies. They just decided not to call it a data center. They're called an availability zone. Sounded cooler. Does uh, the point of presence contains the CDN? Azure puts their points of presence and Akamai's point of presence, et cetera, are located in the points of presence. So yes. Well, I am. Well, when we talk about content delivery networks, that'll be very clear to you. But I'll show you one more time. The edge zone is as follows. When we're dealing with cloud computing, we're dealing with a one, potentially a 1,000, 2,000 mile wire to get to between you and the cloud. And that's just too much. And this is not for web apps. This is for your internal business applications. So the edge zone is simply a place that you can put your, your computers in between your data center, which offers the highest performance and the cloud, which is further away. So it has lower performance and higher latency. Content delivery networks, we will cover in depth and probably spend three hours with it on one of the days this week. Can yet smart cloud providers will use points of presence as the content, their content delivery network because their internet, biggest internet service providers are there. So whether they build their own points of presence or whether they choose to use the pre-made ones, that's up to them. But smart people would take advantage of things that are already located. So I would. Yes, the Azure Edge zone is the same thing as an AWS local zone. Points of presence are internet service provider points of presence, so they have nothing to do with, uh, and they're definitely not inside of an availability zone.
Availability zone is a data center. Availability sets are so far from this, I don't even want to talk about it right now. We'll get into availability sets later throughout the program, though. But availability sets are data centers. Is the edge zone a replica of a data center? JP, the edge zone is a data center. There's no such thing as data center replicas. We have data centers in our data centers. If we own them, they look just like the cloud's data center. An edge zone is a data center. The cloud provider is a data center. There is nothing different about any of these data center. Same routers, same switches, same stores, but generally speaking from the same people. The only difference is, is do you put your VMware cloud on top of it? Do you put your OpenStack cloud on it? Your Nutanix cloud on it? Or the AWS cloud on top of it? Identical technology everywhere. There's lots of data centers in an availability zone sometimes. And availability zone can have many data centers, yes. Um, not at all. So a Wi-Fi range extender is to, is to keep wireless performance working. An edge zone is basically so you don't have to drive 2,000, you take your data 2,000 miles. So completely the opposite. All important things are never on wireless. They're all wired. What is cloud front on Azure? Well, that's a content delivery network. And there are four different kinds of content delivery networks. And guess what? Even on AWS, you may or may not want to use their content delivery network. So it's much important to learn what a content delivery network is. Now, CloudFront's a content delivery network. Azure CDN is a content delivery network. Akamai is a CDN is, that almost everybody uses. Cloudflare is a CDN. And as architects, we must know what is a content delivery network and propose content delivery networks to our customers and know which ones and when to use them for global, not worry about the name of the service. CloudFront's just the name of this Amazon branded content delivery network. There are many, many of them out there. Good question though. Now cookies have nothing to do with top. They actually have to do with website and web stuff. 99% of what we do as architects has nothing to do with that. BCP, are you, uh, I have no idea. I'm thinking birth control pills for my days practicing medicine. I need to speak, uh, use words. Uh, please don't use acronyms. Acronyms cause errors because uh, they can mean anything. What is the relationship between edge zone and CDN? None. The edge zone is where you put your computers closer to you. And a content delivery network is uh, related to... Uh, where users access your web stuff. We'll talk much more about content delivery networks. Is there a local zone in Azure? Well, there's an edge computing place in Azure and that's called an edge zone, which is the same thing as an Azure local zone. How issues can be sorted out when there is traffic block in the cloud? Ashwini, I have, don't understand your question. Um, traffic block, I don't know if you're talking about networking things. I don't know if you're talking about computing things. Uh, happy to help if you make it more clear. Can I please extrapolate more on latency concerns? Sure, absolutely. If I, I need to connect to a computer, it takes time. So when we're dealing with a long distance connection, we're typically dealing with a fiber optic connection. Now fiber optic sends information over a la the laser which is the speed of light, which realistically means in most cases, it can take you know milliseconds to go from point A to point B. Now you may not think milliseconds matter, but I want you to think about a trading application that a bank would have. A bank may have a trading application where it gets information about a stock and it's pre-programmed to make a trading decision within a, a nanosecond. And if you can do it, in a billionth of a second faster than the competition, the bank can buy that stock faster than its competition. Now that billionth of a second strategic advantage could equate to billions of dollars a year of increased revenue in terms of competitive advantage. Now, if you've got to wait three milliseconds to get your computing power in the cloud, that could cost the company billions of dollars in competitive advantage lost due to the latency of the wire. So a company has two choices. One is don't go to the cloud at all, stick it all in their data center, which they can do much better performance in the cloud. Anytime we can always do build a better data center. But the cloud might be cheaper and the cloud's much more agile. So if we wanna use the agility of the cloud and the scalability of the cloud, but we don't wanna deal with the cloud's latency, 
and we don't want to help run our own data centers, we can just connect to a local data center that exists in our city for our high-performance computing, and then run our regular stuff in the main data center for lower-performance computing. And that's what the cloud is, lower-performance computing. By taking, but because the cloud is just nothing more than running out somebody else's network and data center. Okay, Chris, uh, we think we can do one more. Pops or bound data centers? Not necessarily. But any place where you put routers and switches and storage, etc., is considered a data center. So we'll call it a data center, but there's different kinds of data centers. Some data centers just do network stuff. Some data centers do network and server stuff. But there's all kinds of data centers. Okay, so let's get into the con. Get back to the content. And what we're going to talk about today is the Azure Virtual Network we're going to cover right now. So what is the Azure Virtual Network? It is your virtual data center. I've seen people try to call the VPC or Virtual Private Cloud in AWS or VNet and Azure to be a virtual private network, but that's nonsense. The virtual private network we'll talk about is an encryption technology or a way to basically connect two people over a private network a public network in a private secure manner. But this is different. This is the organization's WAN. This is the organization's LAN. This is where their servers are going to be. Their applications are going to be. So this is something very different. Very different. And what it really looks like, it's going to look like this. I want you to think about this. If you look at Azure as just one big giant network and data center, and that's all it is, that's all AWS is, and that's all the Google Cloud is, it's a big giant network and data center, and you rent a part of it. Now, the old rentals or data centers were like this. You'd go to a data center, and you just rack, rent one of their servers and some of their storage, and you just pay for it. It was easy. But now, what we do with the cloud, and here's how we design a cloud. You basically take a regular data center, you install the Linux control plane, which orchestrates the whole thing. And then the control plane orchestrates where your compute powder is placed across servers in your cloud. It's no big deal. My, my, the students in my cloud architect career development program all design and build their own clouds because what kind of a cloud architect doesn't know how to design a cloud? But it's this thing, you just take a data center stuff, you install the cloud on top of it. So that's how it works. You basically take your the, the data center, they install this thin layer virtualization software called cloud software. And that's no different than taking VMware ESXi and virtualizing a server or taking Citrix Zen and virtualizing a server or taking the Linux KVM or QEMU and virtualizing a server. Now we're just virtualizing an entire data center, virtualizing the network. So here's what you can see is in the Azure data center, we're just creating little virtual networks for a customer. We've got uh, virtual network one, let's say that's me. Virtual network two, let's say that my cat's got her own company and a website. Virtual network three, you know, maybe there's somebody else's company. Virtual network four, maybe this is a cat and dog grooming business. I don't know. But whatever the case is, your customers are segregated inside of the same data center. And that's what kind of makes it so cool. So let's think about it a little bit. In this rental space of somebody else's data center, and that's what the cloud is, renting somebody else's data center, you put your virtual machines. And an availability set is just a group of virtual machines. Where an availability is almost a data center, and that's why I don't want to cover them at the same time, but I told you we would get to it. And you put all this stuff, all your network and data center stuff, into the Azure VNet. Now, thinking about this, what is the cloud architect really doing? They're taking the stuff the virtual machines, the databases, the storage, the stuff, the network and data center stuff, and they're migrating it to the cloud, which is nothing more than a virtual network and data center. So think about it. All cloud stuff has network and data center stuff because it's just a virtual cloud. Hope that makes sense. So now let's think and talk about the primary architectures people actually use when they set up their cloud. And they all have strengths and weaknesses and advantages. And you must know all of the strengths and weaknesses as to why. So let's talk about them. And hopefully I don't spill so much water on me. So the first architecture, which is my absolute favorite, is the hybrid cloud. 
And I'll tell you why it's my absolute favorite. Then I'll tell you it's strengths and weaknesses because there's strengths and weaknesses of everything. Here's what a hybrid cloud is. An organization keeps their data center and they use the cloud. So data center plus cloud. Why do I love it? Well, the data center offers the highest performance you can possibly imagine at the lowest latency. The data center is not dependent upon a wide area network, which means the network can go down and you're still up. Now, having a data center and connecting to a cloud is truly a multi-cloud environment, especially when we take our data centers and turn them into the cloud. So a hybrid cloud might be as following. Run your data center, and when you need capacity, shift it over to the cloud. Run your data center. If your data center crashes, shift all your traffic to the cloud. Run your data center and the cloud and share 50-50. And if either one dies or goes down, guess what? You're still up and operational. So who could use hybrid cloud and who would benefit from a hybrid cloud? Well, anyone that needs ultra-high performance computing will do better with a hybrid cloud. Anybody who, for example, put all their eggs in a single cloud, like a hospital. Imagine if the hospital put all their systems in the cloud, a single cloud, and the whole cloud crashed. People would die. So for a hospital, it might make sense to have a hybrid cloud. For a bank, it might make sense to have a hybrid cloud. Keep your high-performance stuff close, and then use the cloud. Who else does it make sense to use a hybrid cloud? What about customers that have 2 and $3 billion dollar? Data center infrastructures, are they ready to throw all that out just to go to the cloud? No. So they might leverage the investment they have in their data center and still leverage the investment from the cloud. So that's why people like hybrid clouds, and that's why I like them. But there's lots of architectures that work. So hybrid cloud is data center plus cloud. Now in that data center, it could be running a private cloud such as OpenStack or Nutanix. Or it could be just the standard data center of the cloud, but that's a hybrid cloud. Migration purposes, ultra high performance applications, disaster recovery, standalone requirements, that is your, your typical hybrid architecture. So what's it look like graphically? Looks like this. You've got your on-premises network. You've got either your VPN or your private line connecting to the cloud, and we'll go over those terms that Azure uses, and your systems are on the cloud. So you've got your data center and you've got your cloud. If this link, this link over here between uh, are your internet connections go down, guess what? You're still up running and operational and you're doing great. So that's why we love this. So keep going. That's the hybrid cloud. Now let's talk about a pure cloud architecture. Imagine an organization that has zero technology. They've never bought anything. They're a brand new startup. And they don't want to get bogged down by buying hardware, even if it performs better, managing the hardware, et cetera, because they're a startup. They've got no cash. They can go straight to the cloud. There's nothing to buy. Zero. The cloud will scale with them. They can deploy things in the cloud super fast. The cloud is generally connected to all your partners, too. Almost everybody's got something on the cloud. So if I can connect to the cloud, and my partners are connecting to the cloud, I can use the cloud to connect to them without building a wide area network. Again, awesome, awesome stuff. I'm looking for the cheapest solution. I go straight to the cloud and it's distributed. So that's why we're gonna, some organizations do pure cloud. And pure cloud is gonna look like this. Now, I'll give you the better the way to do this. A pure cloud is this. A pure cloud is you take your on-premises network, you connect it to the cloud provider, and you put all your stuff. And if you want higher availability, you spread it across two data centers. And if you want higher availability than that, guess what? You spread it across two regions. And that way, you're talking about the following. You're talking about you know, one cloud and leveraging the performance and availability of their system. But I want you to think about this. What if the cloud fails? It's not rare. It happens all the time. Azure Cloud had a failure last year. Google Cloud had a failure last year. AWS had four of them, four of them, big ones, big outages. And here's the thing. It is not abnormal for technology to fail. So what's the solution? Well, with the hybrid cloud, if the cloud provider fails, no big deal. And yes, entire cloud providers fail. 
And then we'll tell you, and we'll tell you throughout this program to use high availability, use two availability zones. And for critical availability, use two regions, two availability zones. But if the cloud gets hacked, the whole cloud goes down. If the cloud has a big networking issue, the whole cloud goes down. If the cloud has a control plane issue or the things that orchestrate the cloud, the whole cloud goes down. So realistically speaking, don't use a single cloud except for a small business. What's the alternative? Multi-cloud, and what's that? Put the same things on AWS and Azure, or Azure and Google, or Azure and Oracle. And then, if either cloud provider goes down, the customer's still up. So that's basically a pure cloud, but across two cloud providers. Very simple to do. And we'll be talking about how to do that all week when we talk about proprietary services and why we wouldn't use them as opposed to when you could use them and what the strategic advantages they purchase. So now you know. So we'll take some questions about these architecture things for a few minutes. Before we do, can you hit the like button? Can you comment? Can you subscribe? Tell a friend, invite a friend. We want to give as many people as possible free training. So Chris will bring on some questions for about five minutes. Is the Azure VNet the same as the AWS VPC? Same concept, exactly, same. Only the names have changed. Can I please say something about Spoke, Hub and Spoke Virtual Network? I will spend a lot of time while I am on the Hub and Spoke Virtual Network when we get to that section of the course. How safe is it to go to pure cloud? Well, I wouldn't put anything that I cared about only in a single cloud provider. I would always use two. I wouldn't ever, ever use a single cloud. And here's the reason. For the last 30 years or 25 years that I've been in networking, we've told people, including the service providers, don't just use AT&T. You got to use AT&T and Verizon in case AT&T has a global outage. You can't use a single service provider if you care about availability. It's just, it's crazy. So I would never go pure cloud. I would do it for a small business. My cat, Cindy, if she ever wants to start a website, I would go single cloud. But I personally design high availability systems. I'd rather one availability zone in AWS and one availability zone in Azure because in investing, they tell you to diversify your portfolio. I don't put all my eggs in one basket and I expect technology to fail, so I like to architect around it. Hybrid clouds that use more than one company provider are considered a hybrid cloud. Now, if they use more than one cloud provider, they're considered a hybrid cloud, multi-cloud. Multi-cloud providers, public cloud providers, often called hyperscalers, and private clouds that you run in your own data center. Are we covering the basic intro AZ-104 content this week? No, this is an Azure Solution Architect Expert Bootcamp, but we are covering the fundamentals as we go. And there are labs which you guys can download completely free. Remember, the free access to the Azure Dialab downloads. Download them completely free, and that will cover those basic admin things that are covered in that AZ-104. Also, while you're at it, sign up for the subnetting and the BGP workshops, and please make sure you come to tonight's show where you're going to hear from the 21-year-old how we helped him get his first cloud architect job. What's the fastest latency the public cloud provide? (laughs) It's always going to be slow, Al, because it's related to the WAN and how far you you are away from them. So you could potentially analyze your WAN maps and try and see it, but assume you're going to get a couple of milliseconds going to the cloud provider, and you will not have that inside of the business. What's the best way to send us secure OCP files? Nader, this is actually an architecture class, not a how-to class. This is about why. Um, So there's that, but you can secure copy, secure OCP anyway. You would in any other cloud or any other data center. There's no different way to do it. Are there many concepts in Northern or not? No, guys, cool dude 5699 and everyone. A cloud is nothing more than a network and a data center. Only the names are different. To, honestly, you could just, if you called, if we took all the companies and we fired their marketing departments and they called the virtual machine, I didn't call a virtual machine Elastic Compute Cloud, and somebody else didn't call it a compute engine instance, you realize it's just a virtual machine. This is all 20-year-old network and data center technology. There's nothing new at all except for Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is pretty much like a private VLAN was 20 years ago. It's all the same. If I told you that if you knew one, you knew all, and if I told you you didn't even know that you need to know the cloud, if you just knew the network and the data center, you'd know all the clouds. 
And then you would just have to learn the silly name the cloud providers call them. You would know everything. Do all cloud providers use SDN? You can use any kind of things, you know, in their infrastructure. I'm sure in their infrastructure, they're all using some MPLS and some traffic engineering underneath it with some RSVP signaling to make sure their bandwidth is good. Sure, they're going to be overlaying some multi critical BGP. I'm sure they're running either an OSPF or an intermediate systems, intermediate systems in their cloud. Of course they are. And I'm sure they all can let you use software to find networking sassy things to connect your run. Can I elaborate on what type of applications are not cloud friendly? Well, you can't do multicast in the cloud. So any kind of multicast thing is a problem, which means a lot of financial applications. And uh, anything that's latency sensitive. For example, a banking application where a billionth of a second is a competitive advantage. You put it on the cloud, it would be a competitive disadvantage due to the latency of getting there. Also things that need zero latency, it's, it takes much more. Hybrid cloud is a data center plus a public cloud. How does network communications between two cloud providers is established? Well, that's pretty easy. You can use VPNs, you can use private lines, you can use software-defined networking, or you don't even have to let the cloud providers talk to you. They can connect back to your data center and you can determine who can, what, and what information you exchange just like you would do any networking. I don't know, we are covering the AZ305. Uh, that's what the Azure Solutions Architect Expert. Hello, can we attach a NIC from a different VNet to a VM in another VNet? No, we can't because IP addresses are have to be private. So you can't take somebody else's stuff and stick it inside yours. No, not at all. Zakai, what's the difference between TCP and UDP? We will talk much more about that because that's a concept that's pretty deep. But TCP is sent when we need reliable transmission. And what does that mean? I'll tell you as follows. Chris, if you're on the end of the fine. Chris, did you hear me when I said this? Yes. Chris, I'm going to send you more information. Did you get that information? Yes. Okay, that's TCP. If Chris didn't say yes, I would have resent it. What's UDP? Chris, don't respond. I'm sending you video, 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 and he's watching it on his TV. That's UDP. There's no reliability built right in. How could the how could the cloud benefit a hundred remote offices with SD WAN with different MPLS providers? No differently than any single data center could have would. It's the same remote access. That's the same kind of method. Nothing's different. How could it be a little cheaper for this? Well, it may be cheaper if your customers are all on there. So I'm a company and I need to connect to 10,000 remote offices already on the cloud, but I don't own them. So I'm an auto parts, I'm an auto manufacturer and I've got a supply chain that connects to attire people, a supply chain that connects to the brake people, a supply chain that connects to steering wheel people, a supply chain that, that connects to uh, leather people, a supply chain that connects to electrical contactors. If they're all ready on the cloud, I just connect to them and I can reach them. And I don't need to put routers in every one of the remote locations because they're already there. I don't need routers and WAN connections. So that's the only place where I can help. Connect to a cloud and they just build virtual circuits across the cloud, just like the old frame relay days. Same thing. Okay, so let's get back to the content so we can keep it fun and moving. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Please hit the bell. Let us know. I want to see if you guys are subscribing and hitting the bell because I know many people are here. So, uh, yeah, please sub subscribe and hit the bell. And that way you'll get notified and tell others to join us on this free training. We want to help as many people as possible. So... If our stuff's going to be on the cloud, 
if we can't connect to the cloud, we can't reach it. So in the data center, which is usually attached to your campus, guess what? You got a wire, right? Multiple wires, it's in your building. So there's nothing to worry about. But we go to the cloud, you got a router, which connects to another router, which connects to a switch, which gets back called to a cloud provider. Now you got to reach the cloud provider because if Chris is on the other end, but I can't talk to him, what good is it? So the networking of connecting to the cloud is what matters. Now we're going to cover the main networking options, which are private lines and VPNs, because they're the ones that are going to be covered on these exams. For the CCIEs out there like me, that are going to be doing some software-defined networking, you know, those these kinds of things, uh, which we can talk about. So let's talk about connecting to the cloud. If you're going to put your stuff on the cloud, guess what? You got to reach it. So we're going to talk about connectivity options, and I'm going to give you some options if you want. I'll even show you how to architect it. So when we connect to the cloud, what are our options? The first option is the cheapest option, which is the VPN, which is not always great and sometimes is terrific. So let's talk about why. So a VPN is basically where you take two people and connect them over a public network. There's lots of VPN technologies. There's MPLS-based VPNs. There's VPLS-based VPNs. There's L2TP-based VPNs. There's SSL VPNs, there's IPsec VPNs, and that's what we're going to be talking about for the most part, where we're going to take two routers and we're going to create an encrypted tunnel over the internet. And if you want, I'll, we'll, we'll be walking you through what that is. And why do we do it? Why do we encrypt it? Well, I need to know who I'm sending my data to. So if I'm trying to send my data to my buddy Alonzo, and it's not Alonzo that I'm sending to the data to, does anybody feel like we've got a security problem? If I'm trying to talk to Alonzo, but it's not Alonzo, it's Joey pretending to be Alonzo like a man in the middle attack, I got a problem. So IPsec enables me to determine who I'm talking to. Now imagine, you've got, I'm sure there's got to be some other Greek people on this call, right? There's got to be some people from Greece on this call, and I say post Isa. Now, to nobody else, other, other than the Greek person knows that I asked, how are you? Because that's a form of encryption. So here's the key. We want to make sure that if I'm talking to Alonzo, that it is Alonzo, and more importantly, that nobody else can hear me on a public network. Because on the internet, and there's spies, and we can see what's going on. Wouldn't it even be cooler? If I sent Alonzo a message, and he could confirm that I received it, and the message didn't change, yeah, that would be good. So I used to practice medicine. I had a patient that would come in with chest pain, and I would tell the nurses to start an IV, give it, give it a sublingual nitroglycerin, and push two to four milligrams of IV morphine. Now, two to four milligrams of IV morphine would slow the person's chest pain, which would reduce the load on their heart so they'd survive the heart attack better. But what if that two milligrams of morphine got changed to 20? The person would stop breathing, and they would have died. So that's what we're talking about. VPN, the ability to secure our messages, make sure our messages have some degree of integrity, authenticate the endpoints, and do this on a private or the public internet. So why the public internet? Because it's there, and we're all connected to it. So how does it work? Well, you're basically, when you're going to set up your VPN, you got to connect to something. To something. So what does that mean? you have to connect to something called the VPN gateway. And what's a VPN gateway? Nothing more than like a router or a virtual machine-based router that you connect to is uh, that you connect to that terminates your VPN connection. So when we talk about VPNs to the cloud, we're going to have a few options. We're going to have site to site. Connect your New York site to your London site, site to site. No big deal. We may talk about multi-point VPNs options. Connect New York to London and Lagos. Same thing. multi kind of connections, and there are multiple kinds of VPNs that we can make. Then we're going to use these VPNs. We need to establish routing, right? You may have a link, but if you don't have a path to get to it, you can't reach it. That's no good. So you're going to need routes, which means static routes or BGP, which is my favorite routing protocol. And join us next week 
for the completely free BGP workshop. Please sign up. The link is in the description below. Please get that. My team will show you because you need to know BGP to be a cloud architect or even a cloud engineer in today's world. And a VPN gateway is effectively doing the same job as a VPN concentrator, for example. So let's talk about the kind of VPNs. Again, the options we have are site-to-site, -site, two locations. And you're going to need, guess what? A router, a point-to-point. -point. Now, in this case, they're just letting you do it on your system, so there's no VPN device that's needed. VNet to VNet. Hmm. Got a customer on the Azure network. Got a customer on the Azure network. Can't we just use the Azure network to connect them? That's a VNet to VNet VPN. We're not even on the VPN. We're just on the Azure network. Multi-site. Global office. Take your on-premise site, connect it to multiple locations. That's all we're talking about here. We don't need to make it complicated. They'd like to on these exams. Let's keep it simple. So why don't we just set the, 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 our traffic over the public internet? Well, it's not secure for one thing. How about private IP addresses? So internal to organizations, do they use public IP addresses for all their systems or do they use the, R the IP addresses spelled out in RFC 1918, meaning the 10.0 slash 8 address space, the 172.16 slash 12 address space, or the 192.168.0.0 slash 16 address space? Of course, we really use private addresses. And you can't send private addresses over the internet. So... That's where we can push them in an IPsec tunnel. Now, if we weren't going to use internet connectivity and we needed to connect to the internet for multiple ISPs, we would have to push all our routes, which would mean taking multiple routing tables from your BGP, which guess what? It's fun for me, but it gets complicated for the non-CCIEs that don't have 10,000 hours of BGP experience. So again, kind of ugly. So private addresses and also routing peers. We can't like take two sides of and form an OSPF adjacency across the internet because they're not on the same subnet. Again, we need VPN. So that's why we're using VPNs. So let's talk about what we're going to deal with, and I'll show you a picture. We're going to be connecting to a VPN gateway, which is just like, just like, just like a VPN concentrator. But the way they do it is the VPN gateways are two or four virtual machines that are deployed in a gateway subnet that function as these virtual VPN concentrators. And you create your, what happens? You create multiple VPN, you can create VPN connections to the same gateway and they're there. So let's talk about what's going on. And let's talk about, is this really reliable or is this not really reliable? The way this can work in this situation is as follows. You've got your on-premise environment, got your on-premise environment. And you create an IPsec tunnel to the same VPN gateway. Life's good, right? It's perfect. Now, if you've got a router over here and a router over here, and you're connecting to the to high availability VPN gateways, then you are realistically speaking in good shape. But, and that's what you'd have to do for a situation like this. So what you can see is really as follows. You've got your data center. Are you sharing your screen? So what you should see in this situation, apologies if I wasn't sharing my screen here, is as follows. You've got your uh, local data centers. And you've got an IPsec tunnel that's going back to the VPN gateways that are sitting in Azure. Because this on-premise location and this on-premise location are in different locations. They have different internet service providers, which means different outers in each location. And they're creating a tunnel to both uh, to from uh, from the on-premise site one. You can see it's got an IPsec tunnel going to the VPN gateway, and another IPS IPsec tunnel going to the next VPN gateway. And what you can see here is as follows: redundancy in your connectivity. So, this is a great way to build some redundancy into your systems across the public internet. So. Now you know what we're doing across the public internet, et cetera. Apologies, I didn't share it there for a second. So let's give you the nitty gritty of the Azure VPN gateways. An Azure VPN gateway provides the following service. 
authentication of the user. And the way this happens, there's a key exchange between the users. Now, because we've got these key exchanges, we can make sure that we agree to the right encryption technologies, et cetera. Next is traffic integrity. So here's what the way that the traffic, the messages are shown to have integrity. We use something called the one-way hash. I find one-way hash is really cool because I'm a math idiot and it's the coolest math treat to me. So I find one-way hash is awesome. Here's what a one-way hash is. If I put the letter A into this cool little hashing algorithm, based upon the hash, we can get a 256-bit response. Big, giant, A, B, C, D, F, G, 2, 5, 9, 7, 6, 5, 3. And it goes on for 256 hours. And the coolest thing is, and I don't understand the math registry, is A always comes out as the same 256 back character. So why do I find this important? And why is this so cool? You can take the 256 character and you can't convert it back to the A. So you can verify the integrity messages if by looking at the hash. So... If I send a message to Alonzo, Alonzo at the other end can guarantee that the message hasn't been changed due to this cool little hashing thing. We think it's really, really, really cool. So keep that in the back of your mind. So you, the same input always produces the same output, but you can't take the output and reverse engineer it. So this is super, super cool. So I can prove that Alonzo is Alonzo on the other end of the line through authentication with our key exchange. And I can make sure the traffic is there. Now, let's say Alonzo sends me something. And then 10 minutes later, he says, I didn't send that to you. That wouldn't be good, right? So I can say, yes, you did. It's called non-repudiation. And that's built into IPsec. Alonzo could say the same thing. So now you know why we're using it. Authentication. Integrity. And non-repudiation. And exactly, I just picked Alonzo for fun. He's part of my team. He's a close friend, and that's why I used it. So what's the advantage of the VPN? It's cheap. Why is it cheap? We're all connected to the Internet. What else is fast about it? How long does it take to create an IPsec tunnel? Alonzo, int tunnel zero on your system. <laughs> IP address, tunnel source, tunnel destination, encryption protocol, done. We're done in 10 minutes. We've got an IPsec tunnel between Alonzo's house and mine. Now, I need good performance between Alonzo's house and mine because I'm going to live stream video to Alonzo and he's going to edit in real time. He's not my video editor, but just to pretend he was for the minute. And I was going to ship him raw video. Now, I can't use poor internet performance. I need private line performance. So what do I do? I call AT&T. Alonzo calls AT&T. They create a circuit for us. After they create the circuit, we get our routers from Cisco, et cetera, et cetera. We get our connections up in two weeks. Three weeks, a month, six weeks. So instant with the VPN, potentially within the hour, upwards of six weeks doing it the other way. So now you can see VPNs are fast. But if it really matters, the VPN uses the internet. Is your internet service provider guaranteeing you to, to, guarantee, to deliver your traffic to the destination? No, no guarantees on the internet. Zero, 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 zero guarantees. So on the VPN, you don't even know if it's going to work. On the wired line, private line, express connect, which we'll talk about, guaranteed, guaranteed, guaranteed performance. And we need that guaranteed performance for certain applications. So what's the problem with it? There's no guarantees. Bandwidth is consistent. Latency is consistent. Go to your computer. Do a ping minus T. www.gocloudcareers.com. Now, don't do that. Do a ping minus T. www.cisco.com. Just for fun right now. And then stop it after two minutes. What you can do if you're doing an ICMP, and I don't want you guys doing too much, but just do it for a minute or so and look at the latency and pick any website you like. It doesn't have to be six, so pick can be Amazon. I don't care. Pick any website you want to just look. And note what is the latency time. Is it two milliseconds? Is it two milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, three milliseconds, lost packet? And you'll get to see the connection and flavor of your speed. See, the internet is not always consistent. Try it over wireless, and it'll be really less consistent. And that's why organizations, if they need something better, they're going to get a private line. But depending upon your internet performance, uh, it might, VPNs can offer a cheap way to do it. So how does it work? Basically what happens is each tunnel sets up what's called an internet key exchange. 
which establishes the security attributes, the encryption type, et cetera, type, et cetera. Then you determine whether you want to do static routing or BGP. And then here's what it looks like in a high availability environment. You basically do the following. In each side, you create a connection to two VPN gateways in two separate availability zones. And that way, if it, one of your systems goes down, you're still up and available and you can reach your systems on the cloud. So that's how you do high availability by creating two VPN gateways on both sides and fully matching, meaning connecting to both. And that way, if one goes down, you've got another tunnel and you're still up and operational. When it comes to availability, I want you to think of this military outage. Two is one and one is none. Because I promise you, if you just have one, it will fail. So two is one and one is none. I like to say one is none, two is one, and three is greater than two because I like to build high availability performance everywhere. Keep that in your mind. So now let's talk about how do you set them up? Now, obviously, you're going to need to have an Azure subscription in place. And obviously, you need a VPN compatible device, like a Cisco router or a Palo Alto firewall or Fuertenet or you know, something from a major company. And then you're going to need a publicly facing IPv4 address. Why? Because you're going to connect on the internet, which means you need a public address. And then next, what you'll have to do is specify the ranges, meaning the site or ranges of the prefix from, from your on-premise that you're going to need to advertise back and forth into the routing. Now, from there, but how do you configure it? You sign into the Azure portal. You're going to find and select virtual network, and you'll click Create. On the basics tab, you'll basically fill in the values for the project details and the instant details. And then you'll specify in the values for the public IP address. You'll select re review and create to run the validation. And once the validation process is done, select create and deploy VPN gateway. And that's it. It's going to be pretty much up and running. So that is the virtual machine. I'm sorry. That is the virtual private network. So. Before we get to the next set of questions, let's talk about express route or private lines. So if a virtual machine is, I mean, if a virtual private network is not guaranteed and it's dependent upon internet bandwidth, which could be ever, what do you do if you need something where you need guaranteed performance? Well, you buy a wire, just a wire. So what is a private network, a, B, a private line? It's effectively like you just bought a wire. A strong, big wire that's guaranteed speed, guaranteed performance, and guaranteed latency, just like my cool pencil over there. It's just like a wire. Or this you know, wire between me and my microphone gear. I'm using a wire because I need guaranteed performance. Otherwise, I could go wireless. Why can't I do wireless? If my cat Cindy turns on a hair, spray, hair dryer, it might affect my thing. And my cat Cindy gets into everything. Hopefully, she doesn't turn off my server today because she does it all the time. But that's the internet. So our express route is the Azure term for private line, private line. So that's it. So if you need guaranteed speed, private line, guaranteed latency, private line, bandwidth, guaranteed bandwidth, private line. And when you really need high performance, that's your only option. Most systems I design because people come to me for transformation all require private lines. So let's talk about it. A private line, which we're going to have to call express route, gets you the equivalent of a private line. And we can deal with bandwidths of upwards of 100 gigs per second, so that's relatively fast. It's much lower latency than VPN, but still going to have milliseconds of latency because we're traveling a long distance. And it's much more reliable than a VPN because there's, no, there's a guarantee that you get it. Now, we could have multiple private lines by themselves and load balance those private lines via BGP, leak a specific subnet on one link and a different subnet on another link and a different subnet on another link, and we could do that. Or we can make life simple, and we can bundle multiple links together. Um, for those of you that are familiar with Ether channel, port channel, and link aggregation groups, we can do the same thing with our private lines. We can bundle four links of the same speed and latency into a single bundle. We can talk about that when the time comes, if you guys desire. And by doing this, we can create even more speed. And we can uh, bundle links of 1 gig, 10 gig, etc. So every time we get an express route circuit, we're getting a redundant, pair, a redundant pair 
of cross connects. And, you know, I'm going to show you what that means. So let's, let's actually, we'll, we'll be showing you some graphics in a bit. And if, and if not, if we need to, I will wipe it out with you because I want to make sure you all get it. So please make sure we'll get, we'll make sure you get it. So private line, think of it as a logical wire. That's it. Now you can get one gig, two gig, five gig, and 10 gig, even a hundred gig. But when you're getting partial speed, I want you to understand what we're talking about. To get two gigs, you're buying a 10 gig connection and they're rate limiting or limiting at you two to two gigs, but you're still buying the 10 gigs. You're getting a five gig connection. It's still a 10 gig connection, which means you need the optics, etc., the equipment for 10 gigs. They're just limiting you to a smaller dose. And now we're going to deal with private lines. The assumption is you need real performance. And accordingly, they're going to, you're going to require you to use BGP, which is my favorite routing protocol, and it's critical. So please, BGP is a complicated topic. Sign up for the completely free BGP session. And subnetting session, that link is in the description. My team will provide it. Please sign up. It's some training you should get. So when you're going to set this up, you're going to need the BGP. You're also going to need a letter of authorization, and we're going to talk about what that means, and that's going to be there for the cross-connect. So I want you to understand this. You're dealing with, um, and we'll wipe right out if we need to in a minute, a wire between you and the cloud. Now, uh, for those of you that are not used to fiber optics, when we're dealing with fiber optics, there's the send and the receive labor on both sides. And it's quite possible that the send laser can go down and the receive laser can be up, or vice versa. And not always will fiber optic connections go down if only one of them is there. But if I'm trying to talk to Alonzo and Alonzo can't talk back to me, it's a worthless connection. So what by, by, by directional forwarding detection, which is supported by Azure, AWS, and all the main cloud providers is, if one of the send or receive lasers goes down, take the whole link down. And that we don't have when it's like one-way audio when you call your buddy on a call. Now, the good news is we're using BGP. So if you've got multiple links, BGP will detect the failure and self-heal or reroute you dynamically like your GPS. On the way to Alonzo's house, right? Here's a static route. I printed out my directions, right? And now there's a, there's a roadblock in front of me. With my, if I have static directions, I'm stuck. But with, a, with my GPS, it says rerouting, rerouting, turn left. Turn right. Hey, there's Alonzo's house on the right. You passed it, Mike. Go. Turn around. Rerouting. Rerouting. There's his driveway. Okay, you got it. So that's what we're talking about. BGP does that for us. And BGP is really cool. That's why. Join us for the free BGP workshop. So let's talk about what this circuit is. It is a logical pseudo-wire. And uh, I'll show you what it looks like, and then I'm going to whiteboard it out with. So let's first look at this. The way it's going to look like this is you're going to get your systems and you are going to get a connection to this building and then they're going to backhaul you, you to the cloud provider. And well, I think this is a beautiful picture. I think we just need to whiteboard this out because I really want you guys to understand it. So let's say we're in this particular environment. So here's what we're going to do. So let's, predict, let's imagine you're in your data center. And uh, we're going to draw a data center with my favorite thing, which is, but, which is a box. <laughs> because uh, the good news is I've been an architect for you know, a couple of decades, and usually there's someone that's really nice and that can take my pictures, and they, they can make it look really good in InDesign. And when you guys become senior architects, you're going to have that. So basically speaking, you're going to have your data center, and here you're going to have your router. And the way these things are going to work is, you're going to be connecting to this building, and the building is effectively a point of presence. Let me just change the color of this text so I can whiteboard it out for you. I really got, want you guys to make sure you understand this. So let's go to home. Let me go try to uh, change this to red so we can see it, and let me get rid of the fill that's in this thing. So we can shape, uh, format shape. Okay, let's get rid of the fill so we can do this. Okay, good. So now we're going to have a point of presence. And then what you're going to have is you're going to have your cloud provider, which is going to be over here. So let's just call this Azure. It could be AWS. It could be Google. It could be Azure. Seriously, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. So the way these connections are going to work is you're going to connect to your router in this location. So you're going to have your router in two places. 
you're going to have a device from you in your data center and a device in this point, point of presence location. And then what's going to happen is going to be as follows. Azure is going to have a switch over here. It's going to be the Azure switch. And what will need to happen is you are going to apply for a letter of authorization, which is going to enable your router to plug into the Azure network. It's called the cross connect. And the good news, they're going to do two of them. Why are they going to do two of them? If the line card on your router or the port on the switch were to fail, you know, we don't want you to go down because of that. So they're going to have give, they give you two connections over here and they're not the prettiest connections. And then what will happen is Azure will, what's called, it's called backhaul. They will build a connection back to their systems. And that's how you're going to go directly from this. And what does it look like? A co-location facility or a point of presence because guess what it is? It is. So that's the way this works. We're going to connect you from your data center to to your router and this co-location facility point of presence, which is then going to run a cross connect between you and the Azure system. And in order to get that cross connect, what do you need? A letter of authorization, which enables you to do it. And that back calls you back to the system. And that's how these networks work. These express route connections, direct connections, et cetera, they work like that. So how do you set it up? Well, you go to the Azure portal menu, select create a resource. And then you'd select networking and select express route. And after you select express route, you'll create an express route group. You'll provide the resource group, the region, the name of the service, and then you'll select the next step, which is configuring it. When you're filling in the values in this page, you're going to make sure you use the correct SKU, logic, standard, or premium, because you want to make sure you get the right one, and the right data, meter, data metering billing model, unlimited or metered. And because of that, you'll be all set up. So now I wanted to see what you to see what it looks like professionally drawn from a real graphics professional. My buddy Alonzo drew this from me because he's really good with making things look really perfect. And I wanted to make sure. So now you'll see both sides of it. Mike Chicken Scratch Notes and Professionally Architected Professional Diagram. So here you can see we've got our on-premise network over here. We've got our router, right? Which connects to our devices. We've got our private line, which connects to the Microsoft devices, which is back hauled to our stuff. And you can see all of our things. So there you go. That's the way it works. Now, normally this wouldn't be a web tier that we're connected to this way, but in this case, it's an internet website that we're using, a private internet versus a public internet. And now you know why we're doing it, what we're doing it, and how we're doing with it, and why. A couple more slides, a couple, few more minutes, and then what are we going to do? We're going to get into questions, 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 so we can make sure that we make sure that we all understand it. While you're at it, if you can give me a like, you can give me a comment. If you're not a subscriber, if you're a subscriber, and please invite others. You can catch the replay of this tonight. I want to make sure everybody, everybody, everybody out there has the opportunity to learn, and we do this for free because we know not everybody can afford this kind of training. We want everybody to have it, so please share the word. Please help others get educated. Please help others get caught hired. Help me help others. It's free. That's what we're doing it, to help others. So let's talk about Azure Network Interfaces last. And actually, while we're at it, give me a hashtag, Azure Cloud, please. Everybody give me a hashtag, Azure Cloud. We're having fun. Hashtag Azure Cloud, please. Let's talk about Azure Network Interfaces, and then we'll go to questions. And we're talking about networking, so I'm sure there's going to be a fair amount. What is an Azure Network Interface? An Azure Network Interface is as follows. It's like, an, it's like when you go to your computer and you've got an Ethernet card in there. That's an Azure Network Interface. That's it, Azure Network Interface. It's a network card that's used in your system. And network interfaces are plugged into your virtual machine and enables it to connect to the network, just like the Ethernet card in your computer. And you've got custom options for setting up your network interfaces. Obviously, public ITPs are dedicated to the resources that are need to be publicly facing. So what's it do? Because I always like to say, what's the tech? Network card, think Ethernet card. 
What's it do? It enables the systems to connect to the internet. Private IPs are used internally. Public IPs are used for outbound things that need to be reachable on the internet. Much easier on the Azure things. We don't need to worry about the uh, internet gateways, et cetera, like we do in uh, the AWS environment, but otherwise it's pretty much the same. And the address is dedicated to the resources until it's unassigned. So once you get an address, it's permanent until you brought until you unassign it. Private addresses are assigned to every virtual machine that you've got to communicate on the network. And private IPs enable outbound communications into the into the local system, public into the public internet. So I've seen some nice Azure clouds in there. Hoping you guys are hitting the like button, hitting the comment button, hitting the subscribe button, sharing with friends. And uh, let's see if you guys are subscribing. I can see how many people are doing it. Come on, we got to get some more. Please subscribe, tell others. I want this free resources to be seen by everyone. Help everybody get caught hard. So now, Chris, uh, Abigail, I'm so thankful to see you there with the, with the wrench. Thank you so much for your help. Can't wait to see a picture of Noni, that beautiful cat of yours. You inspire me every day. Leo out there, thank you. Um, for helping out with these blue wrenches, Alonzo and Eddie with the blue wrenches, and Chow, everybody, thank you so much. So let's answer some questions. Can you configure two express links from the same provider as active, active? Of course, but then to do it, here's the challenge. If you've got two equal class links across different internet service providers, you have two options, active, passive. Now, doing that is a waste of money, right? Or load share. So anytime you've got two equal cost links across different internet service providers, you run into something called a real issue called asynchronous routing. And let me show you what that is very quickly because this is a pretty significant issue and this is why I want you all to attend the completely free BGP workshop that we're gonna do next week because this is critical, critical stuff. So this is what happens if you've got two connections. You're, if you're not a BGP expert, let's say you've got your, I'm going to show you exactly the problem that you'll have. You've got your data center over here, and you're going to have your cloud over here. Your cloud is over here. And if you've got two connections, what will happen is if they're both active and you've got this primary and this active, it's very common for the data to take the top link on the way there and then come back on the bottom link or have some of the data take the top link, half comes back the top link and half comes back on the bottom link. And then what happens is your messages get out of order. So there's two ways you can do it. At the junior intro level, like what they would teach in the AWS Advanced Networking, for example, which is junior level networking, they would say, run active, block the other one. The reality is if you know BGP, you could basically choose to load share across both and create failover recovery. And every customer that matters is going to want to load share over the links that they're paying for. So that means knowing how to prepend an AS, change the weight, change the local preference, change the origin code from incomplete to, from incomplete to IGP or AGP, for example, change the multi X discriminator to leak a more specific subnet. And that's so critical to do. So please join us for the free BGP session, which is coming next week. And I'll teach you how to do it. It's something that very few people know how to do. And if you know this, you'll be an elite architect. So join us completely free, and I'll teach you that there. Great question. Excellent question, Rod. Does this take skill? Is it OK for both VPN virtual IPs to share the same port, even though they're in different locations? I don't know what you mean by that, by same port. Are you talking about an IP port, or are you talking about the same port on the router? So I'm, I'm a little bit lost by the question. So if you rephrase it, I can answer. If not, um, I think you're one of my students. We can definitely work through that in class. But try and rephrase it. Let's go to the next one. Who owns the router in the pub? You do. You've got your router in the pub, and your router has to connect to their router. Good question, Al. James. And like, what criteria do you choose while choosing IP addresses and subnet of the VPN connecting to the data center? 
Okay, so there's a reason I'm going to do a subnetting and supernetting workshop, which I'd like you to join to. There's a lot of science that goes into joining your IP addressing scheme. Get the IP addressing scheme wrong and nothing will work. I promise you it will all fall apart. And who usually does the IP addressing scheme? A non-network architect. And when it happens, the network falls apart because it messes up the routing. Who does it right? Network architects. Who should be doing this in the IP addressing? The most senior IP person on your team. So I'm going to run a completely free uh, subnetting and supernetting workshop next week. And the reason I'm going to do it is so you can learn this. And we're going to spend three or four hours on it. So please sign up. It's completely free. And I'll help you with that. Because you have to set that up. You have to design it. And there's a huge criteria. Contiguous addresses, the ability to route summarize, and the ability to traffic engineer your traffic. And those are the decisions that go through. And that's when we're going to run a separate four-hour workshop just for that. Please join up and tell a friend. Charles. Azure Expects Route is a private line. A private line. Guess what is also a private line? A direct connect on Google. Guess what else is a private line? An Azure Express Route. It is all the same 30-year-old networking technology, and that's why I don't like to call anything by the name. And that's why I try not to tell you, here's the AWS translation to the Google translation. I want you to know it's a private line. And then when it's Azure, good. When it's Oracle, good. When it's Alibaba, good. It doesn't matter. So that's why I teach you this is called the steering wheel because I teach you how to drive. I don't like to teach you this is how to drive a Honda and then have to figure out how to go from a Honda to a BMW and then a BMW or Mercedes. And then what happens when you got to drive your buddy's Subaru? You're in trouble. I just want to teach you to drive. What's the difference between Azure and Kubernetes? Azure is a brand name of a virtual data center. Kubernetes is an open standards management of a container orchestration platform. And we've got the same Kubernetes in our data center, the same Kubernetes in Azure, the same Kubernetes in AWS, Google. It's just a standards-based, uh, and it's the same as OpenShift on the uh, Red Hat platform. It's just a Kubernetes. It's just a. It's just a container management strategy. And guess what? AK, we'll talk about Kubernetes and containers and container orchestration too this week. We're creating IPsec tunnels versus GRE tunnels, so that's different. If it's different tunneling technology. Is Express Route available everywhere? Not everywhere, but most places. Most places. Can you access the internet from a virtual machine inside of a private subnet without assigning an IP address? Of course you can, through net. Now, it won't be reachable from the internet, but of course you can through net. And most organizations do this. So when you go to work, you're going to be using a private IP address, but you're going to be connecting to the internet through NAT, which is going to translate your private address to a public address. But because in most cases they're converting multiple public address, private addresses to a single public address, it's using a special kind of NAT called port address translation, which we'll actually talk about throughout this course. And that is what enables that to occur. Good question. You meant the same part, so I don't completely understand the question. Now, if you're what you're saying is, if you're going to set up an IPsec tunnel from here to here and another IPsec tunnel from here to here, it will all, the destination port will always be the IPsec port. So it's never going to change. So there's that. Now, we'll cover a little more of that today, throughout the program when we talk about access lists and firewall rules. But if not, just ask in class next week, and we'll make sure that we cover it live on Zoom for you because you know we'll take care of that in class. I think you just signed up the other day. I just think I remember seeing your name. Go, pal. VNet, VNet communication in different regions? Of course it's possible. As VNet pairing, which is the same as VPC pairing, which is no different than taking a network from data center one in the US, data center two in Cameroon, and establishing a, a connection between us. No big deal. There's lots of SD-WAN options that you can use. And yes, there is a system for it, but that's not really part of the Azure Solution Architect expert certification, so we're trying to keep it focused to this. But yes, software-defined networking is essential in reality.
Now, this is an interesting one. What's the difference between a VPN and an express route in terms of underlying technologies? Guess what? The internet service providers are going to be using routers and switches. So when you actually create a VPN over the internet service providers, which are routers and switches, you're using the same technologies than if the internet service provider created a private pseudo wire for you. It's identical technology. It's just how the technology is deployed. Can I use a server to create a virtual machine? Sure I can. Can I run the server in bare metal? Sure I can. Can I host containers or a container orchestration on the same server? Of course I can. So it's all the same tech. It's just how the tech's being used. Great question, Osman. Mohammed. IPsec is a protocol that's approximately 20 years old. It's an industry standard, and it's no different where you create an IPsec tunnel across the internet, across the world, the cloud providers, it's all the same. We will talk about Azure DNS and Traffic Manager when we talk about DNS, which is the same as Route 53, but there's times where you can't use a Route 53 or an Azure DNS. What if you're going to go multi-cloud and you want something that survives if, Azure, if AWS Route 53 dies or if Azure's DNS dies? You might want a more robust solution that you can put in three different clouds at the same time. And that's why we're going to talk about the tech instead of just the name. You must have something that you can connect to in the point of presence, so you will need a router there. Any special considerations using IPv6 in Azure? Nope, pretty much same kind of thing. Although 90% of things are still IPv4, although that is changing very rapidly, and that is a great question there, Angela. Still IPsec tunnels, though. Cool, dude, it's just a different implementation. Uh, of, of the same thing. So how are you establishing, a, uh, is it, are you using like an auto VPN where you're automatically dumping things into BGP after the fact, et cetera, same thing. Okay, so I think we need to get back to the content. So I wanna remind you of a couple things. Make sure to download our Azure Lab demos because we're talking concepts, concepts, concepts. Why am I concerned about concepts? On an interview, what do they ask you? Concepts, 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 concepts. And that's what gets you hired. Plus, architects don't configure, architects design. Now, having said that, I still have cloud engineers that want to learn how to do this. Potential cloud admins, and on these exams, sometimes they go through some configuration. So we've got 25 labs for you to do. Download the free Azure Lab demos. The link is in the description box. Sign up. It's free. Go do the things on your own time and work with us to help you. So you can see them directly inside of the chat wow. And that's why we're doing these things, because we want to give you as many career options. Tonight, do not forget to join us at 6 p.m. tonight, the Head in the Cloud show. You're going to hear from Daniel Bosu and how he helped him work with him at 20 years old at the time, just turned 21. And he's now hired by the world's largest bank as a cloud architect. Let's talk about how he did his focus training, what he did, the specifics of what he did, all the things that he didn't learn how to do, like Python or Terraform, where all those DevOps, access ops, or maintenance things, and why they hired him, and it's because he had a special architect profile, and how that architect profile will get you hired, promoted, and paid more. So I want you to learn it all to see that you can all do it. All do it. And please make sure you join us for those free boot camps where we cover the IP addressing next week and the VGP because I want you all to have an unstoppable career. So since we talked about the virtual data center, right, and we talked about connecting to the data center, let's talk about storage. So let's think about this. We're going to generate data, 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 data. If we don't put our stuff somewhere, it's all for naught. It's all lost. So we got to store data, 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 data. So we're going to be talking about the types of storage on the Azure platform. And we're going to get geeky here, and it's going to be fun. We'll talk about queue storage in this discussion. We'll talk about table storage. 
We'll talk about blob storage. We'll talk about file storage and disk storage. And, you know, everybody makes up their own thing. You know, I like my squares because they work for me. Azure's got their cool little diagrams. You can see what they look like, but it's queue storage, table storage, blob storage, file storage, and disk storage. And it's going to be fun. We'll talk about what they are, how they work, and why you need to use them. So we're going to begin with my favorite kind of storage in the cloud, block storage. And what is block storage? Block storage is a type of storage area network. Now, here's the thing. With block storage, we take data, they store it into little blocks, and we store it on the network. So kind of keep that. So what is the limitation for speed of block storage? Guess what? The network. So if you've got a one gig network and you need 10 gigs of performance, you're not going to get it. Now, when blocks are written to storage, they are given a unique identifier. So why is block storage a storage type that we're going to be talking about on the cloud? I want you to think about it this way. Normally, we've got a server. The storage is in the server. So we've got our CPU, our DRAM, our GPUs is needed, and our hard drive. That's our local storage. That's what we normally do. Now on the cloud, that storage that sits on that server is something called ephemeral, which we'll talk about in a minute, but more than that. How much storage do you guys think we can put on a single server? Not that much, right? So we're dealing with block storage for this reason. Block storage enables you to have your server here and you'd have your storage a thousand miles away and the server can use it as if it's local. So block storage basically decouples. And that's why we're using it. It decouples our storage environment from our compute environment. I want you to think about that. We are no longer limited by the storage capacity of a server. So that's why all the cloud providers use block storage. It's the only option we have to make these things scale. It decouples the storage from the user, which means we can stick the box anywhere. So think about this. You got a web server. Files are changing constantly. A regular thing, this is block storage. So this is in the old days, we call them storage area networks. This is block storage. That's all it really is. And your blocks are written to the hard drive or the, the network drives, which are really RAID arrays. And think about it. The blocks are identified. They're simple to identify. They get reconstituted on demand anywhere you want in the environment. That's block storage. And we're going to talk a lot about that. We're also going to talk about object storage, which is a different kind of storage area network with a completely different use. So object storage is another type of storage area network, too. but it's different. With object storage, we take our data in and we break it into objects. Now, object storage is also network storage, just like block storage, which means the performance is going to be somewhat limited by the network. Now, what's cool about object storage, and it's very cool, and there's big data and lots of use cases for object storage, but there's also plenty of places where it doesn't work, too. But with object storage, I take the data and I give it an object identifier. Okay? That's pretty cool. Now, with this object identifier, I can put metadata in there. That metadata is data about the data. Hmm. So now I've got data and information about the data. So if I want to access the data, I might need to access all the data. I can access part of the data or I can just look for what I need. So there's that good. Now let's think about the other purposes of having all this data. I've got data with information about the data. Now I can search that information or run a query in the big data environment and create environments where I can do things with data, mine the data. So that's why object storage is so cool and why we love object storage because what we can do with the data but when the data is broken down into objects and it's placed in a repository. But this storage, this really cool storage, loving, loving, lovely storage is different. We can't mount it to our server as if it's a real hard drive. It doesn't work like that. So we can't use it as a virtual hard drive. Now we can't, 
put stuff that changes frequently on object storage either, and here's why. Let's take something like the swap file, which exists on a server, the virtual memory page file. This thing changes every couple of milliseconds. So you've got a server with a terabyte of RAM. It's got a swap file that's one and a half terabytes. If that swap file changes 100,000 times a minute, which would be normal, um, with object storage, we would have 100,000 one and a half terabyte objects per minute. And this would go on through 24 hours a day. Now, I don't know anybody that wants to pay that bill because in a matter of days, we'd be getting millions of dollars of billing just for the server's swap file. So, op, so what we're talking about here is as follows. We're talking about write once, read many times. So backup and archival purpose is beautiful for object storage. Hey, I just made a new video of my cat, Cindy, and I want to show it to Abigail because she's got the cutest cat, Noni. No offense to Chris's really cute cat, Sonny. They all want to talk to each other. And let's say we all want to share each other's cat photos. We stick it on object storage, like Google Drive, and we send each other something. So that's what we're kind of talking about with object storage. Now, object storage is not hierarchical. It's kind of like a database. you got some data here and a pointer to it. And it's going to look like this. You got a bunch of objects just sort of just stuffed in a place. And we can find them from their object identifier. So let's kind of keep that. Now, and we'll get into the specifics of the cloud provider storage, but I want you to know the tech. See, right now with what I just taught you, with web, when we talked about block storage, does it matter whether it's Azure Disk Storage or AWS, EBS, no, it's the same thing. Guess what we just talked about, object storage. Now, if it's AWS S3, Google Cloud Storage, or Microsoft Blob, guess what? It's the same tech. So I want you to learn to drive the car, not to drive the Honda, and then you learn to learn to drive the Toyota. Great cars, but I want you to just know how to drive. So next is file storage, right? So we've all seen file servers, right? That just store files. You probably have a hard drive that's sitting in your Windows computer, your Mac computer, and your Linux computer that you store files to. Maybe it's got a NTFS drive, a FAT32 drive, Mac OS, extended journal, whatever, APFS. That's your file system. That's standard stuff. can be mounted by devices on the network. So now you know the main components of storage that we're going to be working with on the Azure platform. So let's talk about Azure Disk Storage. So what we'll talk about is actually, uh, we'll start with Azure Blob Storage. So Azure Blob is object storage on the Azure platform. No different than AWS S3 or Google Cloud Storage. We use it for the following, to store very large amounts of structured and unstructured data, usually unstructured. You can stick anything you want in there. Application data, store it there. Files, stick them there too. Audio, video, stick it there. Logs, stick it there. Backup and restore, stick it there. Images of your servers for a disaster recovery environment on another cloud, stick them there. That's what Blob Storage or Object Storage is used for. Now with AWS, we're going to have three blob types, and they're going to be called block blobs, append blobs, and page blobs. I didn't make up the terms, but let's just we're going to go through them. When we're dealing with a blob storage account, what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be dealing with a storage account, which is where it's going to be, like your bucket, the container within the storage account, and we can have a blob within a container, and we'll talk about them. So let's talk about block blobs first. Block blobs store text and binary data. And this can get pretty big, upwards of like 190 terabytes. So pretty big block blobs. Append blobs are going to be something very similar to a block blob, but it's going to be optimized for, ver for append operations, kind of like logging things from a virtual machine. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And a page blob is really designed to store random access files, 
page labs are like where you'd store a virtual hard drive and serve as a virtual disk for a virtual machine. Now, when we're talking about Azure Blob Storage, we're talking about storage accounts, containers, and blobs. So let's talk about this. A storage account is going to be what uses the address that identifies the account. So that's the name of the account that's being used. It's, 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 you'll be able to not know it by a unique account identifier. Now, inside of that, inside of the storage account, we're going to have a container. And that's where you're going to be organizing your stuff. It makes it look like a directory. Remember, object storage is flat data with pointers to the data. But what happens is it looks hierarchical, like as if it's a file, a file folder. And a blob in a container will store block, append, and page blobs. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So what's it look like? Let's, let's, let's show you graphically. So we've got Sally's account over here, right? And she creates two containers. She creates pictures. And image one is about her cat. And image two is about her beautiful golden retriever dog. And then she makes some movies. And she's got a movie of her parrot over here called Movies API. ABI. And she stores it all in the same folder. That's the way this works. Hierarchical. We're creating artificial hierarchy in a non-hierarchical storage. Account owner, container, and then our stuff. So let's talk about securing our data in Azure Blob Storage. If we're going to put it there, we probably shouldn't encrypt it. What's encryption? making it unusable to anybody else unless they have the decryption key. So I'm going to stick my stuff on the cloud and somebody's going to break into the cloud provider and steal their hard drive. I want to make sure they can't access my system. So I want to encrypt it. Now the good news with Azure, encryption is automatic. With some other cloud providers, you have to turn it on by enabling a key management system, etc. With Azure, it's just done automatically for you. It's encrypted and decrypted with AES 256-bit encryption, relatively strong encryption. And primary and secondary regions are encrypt being encrypted with geo-replication as your data is being sent. So we're dealing with good encryption standard all the time. Let's talk about client-side encryption and what that is. Client-side encryption is this. I want to send some data to Chow. Before I send it to her, I encrypt it ahead of time. So basically, client-side encryption encrypts the client applications using things done. It's typically done on .NET prior to uploading to storage. Client-side encryption will also decrypt the information that is needed. So basically, what's going on is you're encrypting and decrypting the information, which is called an envelope technique, which is basically you take it, you encapsulate it in something, and you de-encapsulate it on the app. And the client library will encrypt the entire whole blob. Now, when we're dealing with blobs, we're going to have three kinds of data. And that's for lifecycle management, performance management, and cost management. So what are they? The hot access tier is an online tier that's optimized for storing frequently accessed data or data that's frequently monetized. Highest storage cost, but lowest cost to retrieve it. Because this is what you're going to use for your everyday data. Lowest access cost, but highest storage cost. Now, all the cloud providers have what the better term is a cool access tier. And this is for data that you're going to store and use occasionally. So it's going to be cheaper to store it. But guess what? You're going to pay to retrieve it. So is this sounding a little bit like AWS S3 and frequent access? All the cloud providers have it. This is the cool access tier. And this is where you store your data that's going to be there for a minimum of 30 days. But you're going to pay to retrieve it. So. It's not going to be more expensive to retrieve it than actually use it. And then, of course, there's an archive tier. And the archive tier is as follows. And we'll t uh, is as follows. It's an offline tier for storing random for data where you need it. So let's say you've got lots of stuff that you don't use anymore, but you want to store it for future use or for compliance purposes. We can put it in the archive tier. So that's what that is. That's the equivalent of AWS Glacier. So think hot access tier, optimized for storing data. You use it all the time. Lots of reason, right? You're going to stick it there, your data migration to the cloud, et cetera. Cool access tier. I know I mentioned that, but I'm going to go over it one more time as follows. And this is technology that's used for infrequently accessed things. 
short-term disaster recovery backups, that's large data sets requiring storage in a cost-effective way while you're still using it, but not using it that often. And the, act, the availability is not is lower, slightly lower than traditional availability, but the durability is there, which means that you may not be able to access it when you need it. Most likely you will, but it'll still be there, even if it's temporarily unavailable. And the archive access tier is technology intended to store randomly accessed or archived data for long periods of time. Secondary backup. Lowest storage costs, don't stick it there unless you plan on it being there for at least 180 days. Azure Blob Lifecycle Management, what is it? Well, it's moving your stuff across the tiers as needed. So it's a rule-based policy for transitioning things to the optimal tier. Maybe stick it in the hot for a while, stick it in the cool for a while, and then archive it. So we can create... The, like a transition blob or a delete blob, and we can define up to 100 rules. So what does it look like? Let me show you what I mean by this. So let's, let's draw, draw it out manually because I want you guys to get it. So what does it say? So let's say we need to access our data every day for 30 days. We'll stick it in hot, right? Then let's say we need to use that data rarely for the next three months. But we still need to be able right. to access it. So Are you sharing your screen, Mike? So let's uh, create this particular environment where we need our data really fast. We'll put it in a hot tier. We use it every day for 30 days. And then for 30 days to 120 days, which is 90 days period, we, need, we only need it a little bit. So we're going to look for the coolest, way, cheapest way we can do it. So we're going to stick it in the cool tier. And then what we're going to do is we won't need it for a little while. We may not need it for a period of seven years for archival purposes. So let's stick it in the archive tier. And what we can do with this lifecycle policy is say, keep to here, but send to here after 30 days. And then after another 90 days have passed, we can now send it from the cool to the archive tier. And that's lifecycle management. We can do this on all the cloud providers. And that's really what we're talking about with regards to life cycle policies and blob, et cetera. So let's talk about blob versioning. So as it stands with object storage, every time we create or modify something, it creates a new version. Now, customers might get upset if they realize how big their bill is going to get. So what the cloud providers actually do is they override the default behavior of object storage, which is to create a new version. Then they, by deleting old versions, then they offer you an upgrade to say, hey, would you like versioning, which is the default behavior of object storage. And what does that mean? It means the cloud provider doesn't delete your data or your versions in between things. And then this is a new feature where you get to use the basic functions of object storage. And now you get to pay more to keep other versions of your things, which is great. Imagine a document that's going through 80 revisions. By having 80 versions, the version number 66 got corrupted. You could go back to 65 and start working. So there's those kind of things. And that's why people like versioning. Blob will also allow soft delete. What's a soft delete? Delete it, and then it goes to like a recycle bin for a period of time. And by doing that, you can get it if you didn't mean to critically delete it. And I believe that's something that's pretty exceptional as well. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind. What's versioning look like? I'll show you right now. You create a text. You save it. Each time you save it, it creates a new version because a new one's been modified. Now you got lots of versions of it. I personally think this is exceptional. We talk a little bit more about soft elite. Uh, soft elite is part of a comprehensive data protection strategy. What happens? You delete something and it's stored someplace for a period of time, etc. Absolutely, and then uh, the re and basically it'll be held there throughout a retention period, which uh, which you can which you can define. So it's going to protect an individual blob. So you delete something that can be there after the specified period, it'll be deleted. Now, how long can that be? As follows. The retention period can be as little as one day 
or as many as 365 days. So what you can do, realistically speaking, is you can really put yourself in a position to protect yourself from data deletion. But also, when you do this, you're still going to pay for the storage until it's fully deleted. So good and bad comes with everything. Everything in architecture is a trade-off. Let me show you a graphic of what that looks like. Basically, you delete something, and you can restore it after the fact. So just think of the recycle bin on your computer. That's the way I like to view soft delete. Okay, let's do this. We talked about a lot. There's still much more to go on object storage and Microsoft Blob, and I want to talk about it. But let's open the room up for a few minutes of questions. And then we'll get back to the tech content. So before we get to the tech questions, hope you guys are all having a good time. Make sure to hit the like, comment, and subscribe button. Tell a friend to join this. They can go back and watch the replay. I want to help as many people as possible with this free training. Make sure you sign up for the Azure Lab demos to do these labs on your own time so I can work with you on concepts and knowledge, and you can do the configuration at a time that's convenient for you. Also, make sure you sign up for that BGP session. Don't miss it. The subnetting session, don't miss it. This is critical skills, and I want to make sure you get them, and we're going to do them completely free. Completely, completely free. So let's bring in some questions for a few minutes. Mina, when you consider a load balancer, should it be independent of the cloud provider? Mina, we, we will talk about load balancers when we get into the load balancer section. Sometimes you'll use load balancers from the cloud provider. Sometimes you will need more robust features and need to use something from F5, for example. And we can talk about that once we get to the load balancers. But we're working on storage right now. But we will get to it. Eddie Lace. What's the best way to connect two VNets in different regions? Same way you connect any two things. Either a private line or a VPN or VNet peering based upon what you need to do. No different than anything else. Angela, are certain RAID array types better suited? So Angela is a great question. All of these object storage environments and block storage environments are all RAID arrays. And they're all version, using some version of RAID 5 or RAID 6 or RAID 50. And what that means is we're getting data striping with parity. So we're getting speed and performance. And that way we can lose drives and we're still redundant. Now, Angela, and we're going to talk about this throughout the week. When we get to RAID, realistically speaking, there's going to be types 0 and 1 and 10 that we're going to be talking about on the cloud. As a rule, RAID 5 is used by industry. And we would use RAID 5 on the cloud, but we can't for the following reason. Block storage, despite what the cloud providers tell you, is really low-performance storage. How low performance? I'll give you an example. Well, any of you can go to Best Buy and buy a Samsung 980 Pro for about 100 bucks, 200 bucks, and it'll give you about a million IOPS. With block storage, we're dealing with 20,000 or 50,000 IOPS. So, so much slower. So, we will be using RAID 0 in the cloud to boost block, perform block storage performance all the time. Now, because RAID 0 means no redundancy, and we're going to get to RAID potentially today, and if not tomorrow, we may also use RAID 1, which is mirroring a protection. And RAID 10 is basically using RAID 0 for speed and performance, and RAID 1 for redundancy. We would use RAID 5, but the op and I'll tell you why when we get to the parity section. I'll show you why the latency would not be tolerable with low-performance block storage. Mm -hmm. But all of these arrays are all running, uh, are all storage area networks running RAID array somewhere else. Excellent question, Angelo, and those questions are going to be answered soon. RAID is for speed, RAID 0 is for speed, and RAID 1 is for redundancy. RAID 10 is just a combination of the two, and we'll explain it in depth. RAID is used for all storage area networks, and it's also used by file servers as well. So RAID is used in all storage environments. Now, on the cloud, we're only going to use it in block storage. But the underlying infrastructure from everything is always going to be RAID. My RAID arrays and my network, the RAID arrays on my system that I'm even using to stream this video. 
RAID 5 is for speed and parity, both. We're going to use it for the backup for normal underlying infrastructure needs, but not cloud needs. And please hit that like button and subscribe. Encryption for data at rest and in motion is provided by default. Is it the same for the Azure SQL database? Well, we'll be dealing with different databases and talking about which ones use transparent data encryption and which ones do not. And if they don't, if it's on your private network, you don't need encryption. And if it's on a public network, you may want to encrypt it with an encryption technology. And you're definitely going to want to encrypt your storage, but that's already done. Good question, Paul, and we'll be talking about that. And I've got all of this is the same. We've got regions. They're just geographic areas. And we can make them appear any way we want. doesn't matter if it's AWS, Azure, Google. It's all the same. The names are different. Nothing's different. What's the name for Azure Block Storage Service? Disk Storage. But they've got multiple kinds of disk storage theory, and we're going to get to the name of that. But right now, we haven't talked about Block Storage yet. We just talked about Block Storage in general. So you guys would know how to drive the proverbial car as opposed to knowing how to drive a Honda. Chuka, how do you decide if you're going to use Block Storage or Object Storage? That's not covered in certification, pathetically. That's covered in cloud architect training. But here's the thing. If you're doing software distribution and backup and archival things, guess what you're going to be using? Object storage. If you need to use it by a server, if a system or server needs to access it and read to write to it, it's going to be using block storage. That's how you know. Now, how you architect those storage environments to make them work for the customer is another thing. But block storage used by your systems, object storage, backup and archival only, software distribution only, never used by your system. So it's not real storage. RAID 5 is for speed and parity, not just for parity. It's striping plus parity, same with RAID 6. I run RAID 5 in my storage area networks for the following reason. I've got 12 drives in RAID 5. Each drive is capable of about 200 megabit per second. 12 of them gives me about 11 times 200 megabit a second. And I've got that connected to a 10 gigabit ethernet interface. And I use that by my system because I'm getting speed and redundancy. I can pull out a drive if one fails, reconstitute my data, and I get 12, 11 times the speed. So speed and performance. Let's see if you guys are. Okay, give us some more subscriptions. We've only had about 150 today. We know we should be getting 500 or plus. Please hit that subscribe button and tell a friend. Any other questions before we go on? Okay. So. Let's give me a hashtag Azure Cloud in the chat box so I know you're awake, alert, and oriented. I'm a medical guy. Most of you guys know I used to practice internal medicine long before I moved into tech. And I like to know that my patient's vital signs are good. And since I can't check and see if you're there, if you look healthy, if you give me an Azure Cloud, I know you're awake, alert, and oriented to the class and still learning. So give me a hashtag Azure Cloud. Give me a like, a comment, a subscribe, and tell others to join us. And especially, especially, especially tonight, please listen to how 21-year-old Daniel Bosu got his first cloud architect job. And there's going to be lessons for all of you, so please join us. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So... Now let's talk about organizing our blog data. I hope you guys are all having fun. I'm having fun. All, there's been 1,752 people so far join us, and we're going to get many more. I'm having fun. Let's spread the world of free training to help everybody build their lives. So let's talk about organizing our data into the blog. Remember I told you we got all this kind of cool data. Well, here's what we can do. We can organize our data by using name value pairs. Guess what? It's kind of like a database, huh? And we can create a combination. 
we can create a combination of an account and we can use a fully qualified domain name. Wait, a fully qualified domain name. So I could potentially create something and make it look like it's a website that you could just click download and download videos. So that's how we organize this. So when we create a blob name, it can contain any combination of case sensitive characters. Meaning, and the blog name can be a cross between one character and 1,024 characters. And you can use delimiters to make it feel like a folder. For example, Cindy slash 2022 slash go cloud careers slash storage slash blob dot mp4. And that could be a video of my cat chasing her tail, for example. Something which she hasn't done since she was a little kitten, but it was cute when she did it. She chased that tail. One time, I think she did a flip in the air doing it. It was pretty cool. So there's that. So let's talk about tuning our blobs for performance. We can do something called the shared access signature. And what that does is it restricts access rights to storage users. So you can give this to someone to access things. And we can restrict it at the account level, at the service level. We can do some user delegations. Blobs are scalable. We can stay within a scalability target or we can hit higher performance storage. We can partition our blobs to enable load balancing, for example, if we needed to. We can tune the network capability to make sure there's enough network bandwidth. We can cache data, like from a content delivery network, and we can tune the .NET configuration, for example. So these are the things that we can tune. Let's talk about encryption. Azure encryption models, and these are basically safeguards to protect your data as it moves from one place to another place. The types of encryption I mentioned, we talked about some client-side encryption a little bit, but what is that? Encrypting your data prior to sending it to Azure. And that way it's encrypted before it's uploaded. Now let's talk about the exact opposite, server-side encryption. This means the data is encrypted when it's uploaded on the storage server. And by doing this, it's done via service managed keys, which is one of the options a customer can do. What is this? It gives a balance of control between the user and the cloud provider and it's very low cost. So that's, we're talking about service managed keys. Now you can also manage your own encryption creep and that's called customer managed keys where they marry with them their own encryption key and they manage it. Well, managing encryption keys and encryption key storage is not the easiest thing, but there are certain organizations that need such critical levels that they will manage the encryption keys themselves. And then there's the concept of these service managed keys and customer controlled hardware, customer managed keys on their on-premise repository. Basically you host your own key, you host your own systems to control this. And that's what you can do. So service managed keys cross between you and the provider, customer managed keys, you know, bring your own key with you. Service managed keys is a combination with your own hardware to manage these systems. So let's talk about disk encryption. Disk encryption protects Linux and virtual machines through encryption. Now, how do you do it when they're stored? Well, it's BitLocker, which is used by Windows systems when they store things on Windows systems, and it's Linux DMCrypt when it's Linux systems. And what's going on here is the encrypted virtual machines are gonna use their encryption key, but it's called KEK or key encryption key, and it can be backed up and restored using the Azure backup servers. What is, uh, we'll talk about storage service encryption, and this is basically encrypting your data and rest and it's a blob, et cetera. Those are realistically our options that we're talking about. So you got the concept client-side encryption. We can encrypt it prior to getting there. We can use the storage library, .NET or NetGuru, et cetera. Encryption at rest, how about encryption at rest with the Azure SQL database? Okay, I knew that was coming when somebody asked the question. What is this? It's encryption on the server side. So when you want to upload stuff to the server, it gets encrypted on the server. When you decrypt it, it's decrypted for you. So it's always encrypted, but it's done on the fly. It's called transparent data encryption. Typically use it with the Oracle type databases, and you typically use it with Microsoft Azure SQL as well.
Let's talk a little bit more about key management. The customer can manage their key through the key vault or a key vault with managed ACSM, which we'll talk about. And uh, we can also use key vault managers such as secrets management, key management, and certificate management. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let's talk about Azure encryption key management. Let's take a bit. So what is it? Encryption key management is the administration of all the things that are involved with protecting, storing, backing up, and organizing encryption keys. So now you know what we're talking about here. A customer can use their own encryption key to protect the key data inside of their storage account. And that key data, or those customer managed keys, they can control. Now, if the customer manages their keys, they're the sole owner, and it gives them extreme flexibility and autonomy over where their encryption keys are. So there is a concept of the Azure Key Vault. What is it? It's a cloud service for securing your secret keys. That's all it is. So let's talk about secrets management. That securely stores your keys with stringent access to tokens, passwords, certificates, API keys. And then let's talk about the key management, which are part of the key vault. It's a simple place to create and control your encryption keys. So the Azure Key Vault stores your encryption keys. What else can we do with the Azure Key Vault? We can manage our certificates, provision and manage and deploy, you know, the SSL, TLS kind of certificates that we use the following, for example. And uh, the next thing that we're talking about is two service tiers, which are part of the Azure Key Vault. Standard encryption with a software key and a premium is with a hardware key, et cetera, et cetera. So let's talk about the Azure Key Vault. I'll show it to you. Realistically speaking, the customer can access through the portal, PowerShell, or an API. You can see, realistically speaking, um, we're dealing with a storage area account environment. And we're talking about you know, the, the key management and where it can be stored. and where it can be stored. I do see there's some people that are asking some career questions. We will have on Thursday a completely free how to get your first cloud architect job webinar. I'm seeing people that are asking some very good questions and getting some good answers too, but I want to make sure that we can answer your personal questions and make sure we can guide you for you. Because, you know, it's impossible to be an architect without knowing network and data center technologies. But different kinds of architects need to know different things. And I want to make sure that we get you guys that have questions that desire to be different kinds of architects to learn exactly the things for your career. Because what a cloud network architect does is different than a cloud IAM architect, which is different than a cloud security architect, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to get you all cloud hired, cloud paid more, cloud promoted, and have the best cloud careers. So... I, am, I will be also online tomorrow free at 9 a.m. to answer any cloud question careers you have. And tonight, all of you, please join us and hear how 21 Daniel Bose, when you're old Daniel Bose, who got his first cloud architect job on our channel. And how he went from learning completely brand new from scratch to how we got him hired. So I want you to know, because if you want to train with us, we'd love to train you. If you want to train on your own, I still want you to know how to do it. I want you getting hired in either case but there's a very specific set of things that it needs to be for the architect. So please join us and I'll answer all those questions then. So when we're connecting to things or connecting to storage, we gotta identify it, right? How do we know where things are, our resources, or our storage? Well, the good news is there's a uniform resource identifier. What is this? A uniform resource identifier is a character sequence that identifies something where it is. And it's a logical abstract or a physical resource. So it tells you how to find something, how to secure it. And it's called a uniform resource identifier. Now, a uniform resource identifier grants access rights to something. So here's the identifier to the picture of Sonny the Cat, for example. 
Unifor identifier identifies the photo of Sunny the cat. Now, inside of there, we can, it's intended so that way you can have somebody that can see a certain thing. So we're also going to use like a shared access signature, which we'll talk more about too. What does a shared access signature do? It grants limited access rights to something. So I want to allow Pawan Kumar, I see he's here. He's a great architect and engineer. He's got lots of great capabilities. He wants to access something. So what am I going to give him? I'm going to give him the access to this one thing that he can attach. And he's going to have specified permissions based upon the signature. And the uniform resource identifier query patterns will contain something called an SAS token, a shared access signature token that possesses the information that says, allow Pawan Kumar to access my storage account. And that's the reason why we're doing it. So let's talk a little bit more about the Azure Shared Access Signature. At the account level, and I know this stuff's kind of dreary and dry, but we got to get through it. At the account level, we're dealing with delegation of access resources in one various stage or service. We're able to delegate access to determine read, write, and delete options concerning blob containers, tables, and file shares that wouldn't normally be permissible with the service secure. And we're talking about service levels that really provide what's called delegative access to a resource in one of the following storage service types, blob, file, or queue. So realistically, it's just providing a secure means to access it. And of course, we can deal with something called user delegation, which is secured with Active Directory credentials. So how are we dealing with the IAM or Identity Access Management, otherwise known as AAA, authentication, authorization, and accounting for your stuff? Active Directory, which is what everybody uses, so it sort of works. So how does this work? And then we'll get into much cooler storage in a second. It works via as following. Basically speaking, we've got a user. They authenticate and get their token, and then they can read the data. Now, I know I got in some complexity and stuff that you may need to know for the exam, but that's all this is really about. It's about. So let's talk about you know Azure Virtual Machine Storage. This is block storage. Block storage, what we're talking about. So let's talk about the kinds of virtual machine storage. We're going to have ephemeral storage, and we're going to have block storage. And let's talk about the difference. In the server, you're going to have a boot drive. Now, this boot drive is going to be fast really fast because it's going to be the storage that's sitting on the server, which means blazingly fast. It's not slow block storage. It's blazingly fast system storage. Now, here's the challenge with the system storage. It's stateless. It's not persistent, which means once you delete the virtual machine in the operating system, it's gone. So if you're going to deal with a server, and you want to store your data, if you store it on the ephemeral disk and then something happens to your server, it's lost and gone forever. So that's not good. But we still need something to start the system. That's typically ephemeral storage. And if you've got a non-persistent workload, it's blazingly fast. And once the asset deleted, it's gone. So there's nothing to pay for after. So minimal latency. And it's free. You get, it comes with it. And all regions support this. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And when we're dealing with storage, we're going to be dealing with two kinds of storage. Here we've got our virtual machine. Here's our OS. That's our ephemeral storage. And then we're going to use another disk, this data disk. That's going to be our block storage. That's where we store the stuff that matters. So let's pretend this is a database. Here's the operating system, our application. Here's our storage, all our database stuff, which is really, really critical stuff. So that's what we're talking about with regards to femoral storage. Managed storage now. So now we're getting into server storage, something I love, server storage, storing stuff that matters used by our system. So what kind of storage do we have? 
because we're dealing with the cloud, we have to deal with block level storage volumes. And they are intended for mission critical workloads. They're basically virtualized, network based hard drives, meaning storage area network, but it looks and feels just like a virtual machine. Just like a hard drive inside of your virtual machine. So there's that. So that's block storage, and that's going to be called Azure Managed Disk, and there's going to be lots of time. Consider them virtual hard drives that are network based. Highly persistent, they're highly scalable, and they're highly available. And if your system goes down, it gets terminated, we still keep it until we delete it. So isolation and avoiding a single point of failure. So now let's look at it from another perspective. You can see here, we've got a virtual machine with a couple of managed OS disks, two different kinds of hard drives in the same thing. Hey, wait, you might have two kinds of hard drives in your servers. Maybe some NVMe storage for something that really matters, for example. And guess what else? Some standard SSDs for stuff that doesn't matter as much. And some magnetic drives in your server for things where you need lots of data. Same thing here. We're going to get to choose our types of, of block storage environments based upon performance needs. So when we're dealing with Azure Managed Disk, it's block storage. It's going to be... a it's going to give us. Now, when we're dealing with block storage, we get lucky. We can actually create a snapshot or an image of our machine. And what is that? If we have a disk and we can create an identical copy in the form of an image, then we can reconstitute that disk at any time that we desire. How cool is that? We can reconstitute that disk any time we desire. We love that, right? So... If we need to back up our systems, we're doing it with a snapshot. It is a point in time, bit by bit, backup copy of a drive. It is amazing. And that's what we're dealing with the cloud, which is one of the things we love. We can create snapshots. And with our disk, we can create a snapshot, which is a point in time backup. Once we make a snapshot, it's there. Now, we can do an incremental snapshot where we take one snapshot and only change the difference each time. And that way we can create multiple versions of our snapshot. For example, made a change to a server today. It was perfect. Create a new version tomorrow. That was perfect. The next day, there was a new version, which wasn't bad. Roll back to an earlier version, which we can do that with incremental snapshots. That's what it is. Make one, and each one just contains the changes or the delta between versions. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So that's what we're realistically speaking, we're talking about over here here. So let's, what are we talking about, for example, and let's look at how cool we can do this. We can take our systems in an environment. We can then create a snapshot and then bring that snapshot to another region. So if something happens in our region, don't worry, it's backed up somewhere else. So this is really good backup archival storage purposes. We love stuff like So when we talk about Azure Managed Disks, we're going to talk about managed disks and block storage. So we're going to have ultra disks, premium SSD, standard SSD, and standard hard drives. But think about it. Ultra disks are not going to be that much different than a provision IOPS, Viome, and AWS. Premium SSD is going to be something very similar to a slower version, like an IO1 device. Standard SSD is going to be like SSD-based storage on Azure. And standard hard drives are going to be just like magnetic storage on AWS. It's the same thing. Guess what? Same storage, same technology. doesn't matter the cloud. Only the names have changed. Like the Bon Jovi song. Only the names have changed. Same thing. Or the Who song. Meet the new bus. Same as the old bus. It's the same thing. Just the names have changed. So let's talk about ultra disk storage. This is the best performance we're going to get on the cloud at least through AWS, and realistically means we can, uh, it's designed for high IO workloads, specializes in transaction heavy workloads, upwards, maximum of 160,000 IOPS. Maximum, maximum, and 300 IOPS per gigabyte. So compare this, go to Best Buy, spend 150 bucks on a Samsung 980 Pro. 
Get a million IOPS on a $150 drive. Or get this, 300 IOPS per gigabyte. So how big does your drive have to be just to get this kind of performance? You can't get above 160, which means if, if, if we needed a million IOPS, we're going to have to do RAID because there's no other way to get it. And we'll talk about RAID next. So let's go through these devices. This is the fastest performance. This is relatively equivalent to the IO1 device, IoT device that we're dealing with in AWS, the newest, fastest, most perform highest performance version of block storage. Now let's talk about premium SSD. Now this is still good secure storage, high performance, low latency, if you want to call it that. It's intended for high input, high output operations. Good for mesh and critical productions, because again, this is high availability, high performance storage, designed for millisecond latencies. Millisecond latencies. So when you're trying to build nanosecond latencies, this is not going to work, because it's already a thousand times greater than that, or more. You can make it up to uh, four terabytes, 40,095 gigabytes. What are we dealing with? 7,500 IOPS and 250 megabit per second throughput. So not super fast and not super low latency. It enables some disk bursting. Here's what bursting is. You can exceed your capacity for a short period of time and not SIGR and still get performance and let the, the provider will let you do it, which gives you a little bit of extra scalability and flexibility. Standard SSD, well, the last one, which we talked about, Premium SSD wasn't exactly fast. So let's talk standard SSD, which is even slower. It's intended for workloads that require consistent performance at a low input output operations per second level. It's the optimum choice for varying workloads supported on-premise and off-premise. It's designed for high availability, persistence, and acceptable latency. Maybe web servers and non-production workloads, not like high performance, like a database. And for stuff that's slow, not super high performance, variable traffic passing, and of course you've got some bursting, so you can exceed your capability for a short period of time. And then let's talk about the standard hard drive, magnetic storage, everybody. So low cost, reliable transportation. So performance is gonna vary. It's good for virtual machines, dealing with latency sensitive, tolerant applications. So dev test situations, environments, not real good performance. I'm going to end on RAID today, most likely, but before we do, we've covered a lot of stuff so far. So let's bring in some questions on storage. So if you've got some storage questions, let me know. Then we'll get into RAID, which is some pretty important architectural things to be thinking about. And then... Uh, We'll have a really good show tonight. What is the difference between connecting two VNets through VPN or VNet peering? Okay, I'd like you to think about this. So here's two VPNs. I'm going to my house, and I'm going to connect to Chow's house. Chow and I both connect through the public internet, and we create an IPsec tunnel between us. So we're connecting through the private internet emit. Now, is there internet performance guaranteed? Not at all. Is internet latency guaranteed? Not at all. And does the internet have to get my traffic to Chow? Not at all. So that's what happens when you create a VPN to connect two organizations. Now let's talk about a private network by comparison. If you're already on the Azure network and your other customer is also on the Azure network, wouldn't it be more efficient to connect to each other directly across the Azure network and never go to the public internet? Public internet has security concerns and the public internet doesn't have to deliver your traffic. But Azure to Azure on the same network, it's on Azure's high performance backbone. That's the difference between VNet peering and VPN peering. In either case, you're doing the same thing. The difference is, is do you send it over the public internet or do you use Azure's network? Now, on the Azure network, you don't have to, you're paying Azure network transfer charges, but it's less than internet transfer charges. It's more secure and it's faster. So generally speaking, we don't want to keep our traffic on the internet when we don't need to. We want to keep it in a high performance environment. 
Good questions. Let's go to the next one. What is the real use case for ephemeral storage? Well, Juan, what a great question. So just to boot up your virtual machine and nothing else. It's just a boot drive. That's it. So think of it this way. You have a server. It's got a boot drive. That's your ephemeral storage. And then mount some kind of managed disk attached to it to store everything that matters. Just a boot drive. And you just want a high-performance boot drive. You could potentially use it anytime you needed higher performance storage as well, but realistically speaking, not too much. I don't know what you mean by data dispersion, Paul. So could you ask more in the concept of architecture, higher speed, higher performance, lower latency, scalability, or some kind of business metric that you're trying to achieve and that I'd be able to help you? There's lots of things that have 10 to 15 names. So I really want to know what you're trying to achieve. Because I don't know if you're talking about distributing data, for example. I don't know what the latency speed requirements you have of your data. I don't know if it's latency data or throughput data. And here's the difference. I've got two options. I'm going to talk about latency versus throughput. Throughput is as follows. I want to send Alonzo a huge video file. I need high throughput. Now, I need to write to a transaction to a database a million times per second. I need low latency. So I'd like you to look at it as a Ferrari versus a tractor trailer. In the Ferrari, you got a small trunk or boot, and you can put maybe 100 kilos of stuff in it. In a tractor trailer, you might put 30,000 kilos of something in it. Now, the tractor trailer goes from 0 to 60 in 30 seconds. But the Ferrari does it in 3. But I've got to move a huge load 1,000 miles. I take the tractor trailer. But let's say I needed to buzz around town as fast as possible. And I hired a race car driver. They could get faster from point A to point B in the Ferrari, especially if all they were delivering was Hershey's Kisses or something really small. So it's about determining the latency or the throughput that you need. So I need to know your, what kind of data you're trying to send. Are you sending video files? You need high throughput. Magnetic would be perfect in a RAID environment. But do you have a, trans, a database that needs 100,000 transactions a second? You need low latency. So data dispersion could mean anything based upon the kind of data, and that's why I need more information. Because we architected completely different based upon the goal. And they're different. If there's a total failure of the cloud, that's why you should never use a single cloud. I mean, that's the whole point of going multi-cloud or hybrid multi-cloud. Don't put all your eggs in a single cloud, and then you're not going to go down if the cloud goes. Nobody should do single cloud ever. It's crazy. Hybrid cloud, have your data center connect to a cloud. Have your data center connect to two clouds or connect to two or three clouds. One is none. Two is one, and three is greater than two. It's insanity to use a single cloud ever. Because when that cloud goes down, and it will go down, I promise you, it's just a matter of when. All cloud providers went down this year. And I don't blame any of the cloud providers for going down. I've been in tech now for 25 years. I've never seen it where a service provider didn't have an outage. We expect the outage. We plan the outage. So use multiple cloud provider service providers, and you'll never have a problem. Plan it on one, and you'll, you will have a problem. And I don't ever recommend designing a single cloud provider solution. Good question. Let's go to the next one. Any others? If not, we'll talk about some RAID, which is a fun one for me. Love talking about RAID. And what we can do is we can end on RAID. And if you guys have some other questions, I can answer them for a short period of time. So let's talk about RAID. 
And we can actually, before we get to that, we can answer this one question. How many customers or organizations to use multi-cloud? It doesn't matter. I mean, if a company has a WAN, they're always going to use two different internet service providers. If I've got two options, I can use two data centers or two availability zones in a single cloud, or I could use one availability zone in two different clouds. Okay? Either way, it's the same thing. Or if I need higher availability, I could use two availability zones in one cloud and two availability zones in another cloud. Why would I ever put all my eggs in one basket? Ever. Seriously. Why would I subject myself to, a, to an outage at a cloud provider? There's no reason to ever. So everybody should use multi-cloud. Here's when I wouldn't go multi-cloud. My cat Cindy decides to start a website. And she wants to, on her website, send pictures of her licking herself and clean it, doing her fur. And then she wants to have a cat calendar. And then she wants to start a cat blog where she writes about her life as a cat. That could go on a single cloud. Now, Naga, six months later, my cat Cindy has a social media following of a million people on Instagram, 10 million on Facebook. Guess what? Now we got to use a hybrid cloud or a multi-cloud because it's too important for her to go down and people can't buy her cat calendars and things. So how many customers to go multi-cloud? If it matters, a multi-cloud. If I don't care about the systems on the single cloud, but then again, if I don't care about the systems, why am I bothering? They don't need a cloud architect in the first place. So there's no customer that, that I would ever recommend single cloud to, but I never would have. Not just because the cloud outage last year, because we never designed networks with one WAN provider ever. So kind of those kind of things. And it's not load balancing that we use to go to multiple clouds. It's DNS that we use to multiple clouds or many other options. So that's based upon BGP, load balancing, DNS, or any of the ways that we would architect any other network. No business would only have one data center. They'd be crazy to. They always had two. So it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Doing well. Mike, is the cloud architecture like a normal standard job? Not one bit. As a cloud architect, you go to work. You might be buying people lunches, telling drinks, leading a team of engineers, responding to an RFI, RFP, RFQ, delivering a presentation, and writing a white paper, or selling. As cloud architects, we don't touch the tech ever. We design and present and sell. It is a combination between an executive job and a technical job. So there's kind of those things that we're going to talk about. Let's talk about RAID. And tonight, all of you, please join us on this conversation. And on this conversation tonight, you will hear about the Cloud Architect job being so special. You will hear about why we did very special training with Daniel Bosu, why we trained him in a way that was unlike everybody else that's doing training, and why at 21, without degrees in tech or de college degrees, period, or experience in tech, the world's largest bank is hiring him as a Cloud Architect, and why he's so great and how he did it, by learning the exact right so let's talk about RAID, a redundant array of inexpensive disks. What is RAID? RAID is when you take multiple hard drives and you can combine them better to look like a single hard drive. We do it for speed, we do it for performance, and we do it for redundancy. And the main RAID types are RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, and RAID 10. Now, there's other flavors of these, but these are the main RAID types. Let's talk about RAID 0. RAID 0 is fast. I love RAID 0. I use RAID 0 in video editing because I've got big video files, and I only store them there for a short period of time. And then after that, I get them off RAID 0, and I store it in long-term storage, which is RAID 5. So what is RAID 0? It is striking your, striping your data across multiple hard drives. It is taking multiple hard drives and putting them together for maximum speed. It's like, let's say you had four brothers. If four brothers all shared the load, you'd each have to do one-fourth of the job. Or you had four sisters. They each share the, the load, so it's the same thing. Now, 
when we're doing this, we're going to get the fastest speed, fastest performance, but we're going to have zero redundancy, which is very, very risky. So we'll talk about what that is, and let's show you what it means to look like visually. This is RAID 0. RAID 0 is we take our data and we stick it on multiple drives. So think about the performance impact of this. Data here, data here, data here, data here. So data block one on hard drive one, block two on hard drive two, block three on hard drive one, block four on hard drive two, block five on hard drive one, block six on hard drive two, block seven on hard drive seven, block eight on hard drive eight. Hey, wait, is that like low balancing pre 30 years ago? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So that's like your load balancing between hard drives. Now think of this. If you put half of your stuff on hard drive A and half of your stuff on hard drive B and hard drive A fails, half of your stuff is missing. Ooh, that's not good. Now let's say we deal with real high performance and we put 10 drives in RAID 0. Hey, wait, we've got to get to a million IOPS like that Samsung 980 Pro. We've got maximum of 160. So 160 times six, we need six of these things. So now you've got six drives in RAID 0 and one fails. Everything is gone. So RAID 0 is fast, fast, fast. But it's, it's not safe, safe, safe at all. It's unsafe because lose one drive, lose it all. But highest, highest performance. So now, let's talk about RAID 0 and cloud. RAID 0 is generally too risky for the following reason. If you lose a drive, you're done. Now, when we're dealing with block storage volumes in the cloud, their logical volumes and our, e our block storage volumes, not EBS, that's the AWS name, but it managed disk, guess what? They're backed up to multiple availability zones. So it's much less dangerous to do RAID 0 in the cloud because if you lose one of the drives, you've got your RAID array backed up somewhere else in the cloud. So it's not terribly risky on the cloud, but I wouldn't do it. So let's talk about the next solution, which is RAID 1, which gives you no performance enhancements, but critical redundancy enhancements. What's disk one? It's mirroring. So now, Eddie, Patrick, and I, we're together. We're now a RAID 1 set. Eddie, Patrick works for me. He's an incredible cloud architect. He lives in Cameroon. He's fantastic. So now, here's RAID 1. They put the data to my hard drive, and they copy it to Eddie, Patrick. Put data on mine, pox it over to Eddie. Puts data on me and copies it over to Eddie. Now, I get sick one morning and can't wake up. Eddie says, I got all the data. Break the mirror and you can get it all from me. That's RAID 1. Pretty cool, huh? So my one drive got dies. The other one backs it up. So RAID 1 is mirroring. Wow, RAID 1 is really viable. So what's the downside? No speed enhancements. Anybody else see another downside? Guess what? Now I need two sets of storage, which cost twice as much. Twice as much. So let's think for this. This is what it's like. We copy everything from hard drive one to hard drive one and hard drive two to hard drive two and hard drive three to hard drive three and hard drive four to hard drive four. Maximum perfect storage, but no speed. So now let's talk about what we use everywhere, but we can't use in the cloud. But I'm telling you, the cloud providers are using this for your storage on their system. RAID 5. RAID 5 gives you a combination of speed and redundancy. It requires a minimum of three drives, and we stripe the data across all the drives, and we stripe backup data across all these drives. Now, this backup data is called parity data. Parity data. So high speed, high redundancy, and it's used by most enterprise environments. So how does this work? Well, this is kind of the coolest thing ever, at least it was to me when I learned about RAID 25 years ago, and I've been using RAID 5 since. Now we've got four hard drives. Now when we do RAID 5, we lose a single drive. 
because what we do is we take our data plus our backup data. And here's what it looks like. We put data on drive one, data on drive two, data on drive three, and backup data on drive four. Now we put data on drive one, data on drive two, backup data on drive three, and data on drive four. Now next time we put data on drive one, backup data on drive two, data on drive three, and data on drive four. And then next time you can see we put backup or parity data on drive one, and then data on drive two, three, and four. So what you can see is we're constantly rotating the data and the backup data. Now note, we've got parity A, parity B, parity C, parity D, or backup data. Now if any one of these drives fails, like this drive over here, all I have to do is pull that drive out, pop in a new blank drive, and ask the RAID array to rebuild the data. So RAID 5 gives us data, speed, and parity. Now why can't we use this in the cloud? Remember I told you block storage is pathetically slow, regardless of how fast they want to tell you it is. And every time we write backup data, it actually adds a little bit of latency. So in the data center, in your high-speed RAID arrays, that latency is meaningless. But in a cloud provider where your, where your, your block storage volumes are slow, this additional level of latency is unacceptable, and that's why we don't use RAID 5. So what do we do instead? Well, we need speed of RAID 0, but it's too risky. We need fault tolerance like RAID 5, but it can't do that because of latency. So we do RAID 10, which is just a combination of RAID 1 plus RAID 0. Seriously, that's all it is. And what does that mean? What does that mean? It means RAID 10. And what is RAID 10? RAID 10 is RAID 0 plus RAID 1 combined. So we get speed and total redundancy. Now, imagine this, how expensive this gets, gets, because now we need twice as many disks. So what we're doing is we're dealing with two RAID 0 arrays. So, disk drive, so basically you can see in the top, we're dealing with RAID 0 between these disks, and they're fast, 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 just equal. It's like we're low balancing across each one. And then we're mirroring via RAID 1 copies between our RAID 0 arrays. So lose a RAID 0 array, no big deal. We are still up and operational. So that's all we're talking about on RAID. So, you know, I'm thinking about, um, I, I think that's probably a good place to stop and ask your questions. Tomorrow we'll talk about migrating data to the cloud. And then after we talk about migrating data to the cloud, We'll talk about uh, some compute services in the cloud. It's going to be a big, real, lots of fun. We'll probably talk about some container services. But let me answer some questions. And while we're at answering questions, can you give me the following in there? Can you give me a hashtag cloud hired? And can you give me a hashtag Azure Architect? Because we want to signal that all of you that are taking this Azure Solutions Architect Expert Training, this free Azure training, this AZ305 free Azure course, no. Let me know that you're awake, alert, and oriented while the questions are coming in. So cloud hired and cat hired. Yes, Abigail, cat hired. Cindy has a job here, my cat Cindy. She's the troubleshooting coach. She chews through ethernet cables. She unplugs OpenStack cloud servers. She shuts off servers with her paws. She recreates all kinds of troubleshooting environments for us. And she has a job, she's cat hired. And then, Chris, if you want to bring in some of these questions for me, which I hope I didn't get out of the way with all the responses that I asked for. Hybrid cloud is intended for high availability. Hybrid cloud could also be used if you need low latency, because remember, there's latency times between there. Now, in terms of asking terms like RPO and RTO, I'm an architect, so I communicate in simple, plain language. I can't use terms like RPO and RTO to my customer. The reason is my executives are my customers. My executives don't know what it is. How do you in a high availability multi-cloud environment make it work? Well, you're going to use DNS, right? Somewhere along the line, DNS is going to be checking your data center. Are you there? And if it responds, it's up. It's going to be checking the next data center or cloud. Are you there? And if it doesn't respond, it reroutes your traffic. So by using a high availability DNS situation, which is easy to do, 
we can use DNS to run a health check, which we'll talk a lot about, which will detect a down cloud Dow data center and you'll be up and running. So you know, that's nothing to do to, to deal with this. We can create three clouds and have them up and operational. So when we talk about disaster recovery, we have to determine the following. How critical is the business? What kind of disaster recovery options do they have? Disaster recovery is nothing. I mean, we can run three clouds up, up if we want. And we can have it fail over in a minute's time or two minutes time based upon our DNS health check. We can use load balancers to do this. We can use BGP to detect it. So realistically speaking, it's dependent upon every single architecture. So the question I would ask you is, what are you trying to do? What are the business requirements? And that will determine how we do it. So there's a difference between architecture and engineering. And I'll make this very clear. Engineering is about how to do stuff. Architecture is about how to improve the business. What determines the way to do this is as follows. What are the business requirements? Do we need to fail over in two seconds, three seconds, 10 seconds, two minutes, or two hours? You ask me that question and tell me those requirements. And then I can tell you one of the many ways we can do this. But there's a lot of ways to do this. But the business requirements will determine the best way. So hope I answered that concept. Chris, bring in the next question. With regards to RAID, if data encryption is on by default, why is there such things as bit splitting and erasure coding, or is the encryption within the RAID? So we're talking about two different technologies. RAID is where we're distributing the traffic and sending the traffic on our hard drives. And encryption is something else where we're going to use to secure it. They're completely unrelated. Now, you can do special kinds of erases to make sure that your data is completely dead in case somebody steals the encryption key, but they're unrelated concepts. Khalid, oh, this is a question. What happens if you're using a RAID, uh, the customer has a RAID controller, and it fails? Well, most customers that are using RAID controllers are using very, very standard RAID controllers. And if one fails, it's no big deal to get another one. Now, any time a customer is using specific things that are out of the norm, that are hard to get, it's incumbent upon them to keep spares and good, good service contracts because you can't keep your systems up. Now, Khalid, I'm not going to tell you that I don't know systems that have rate controllers of companies that have been bankrupt. Now, if a company in their data center has got their stuff on systems with companies that have been bankrupt that no longer make it, it's incumbent upon them to get their data off of these systems and onto another storage area network. Never, never, never should somebody run end-of-life hardware unless there's a strategic reason to do it. And that's why, like the U.S. military that still needed to run Windows 10, for example, 20-some years later, had to go to Microsoft to get extended support on it because we can't run unsupported stuff in a production environment. We can on my cat Cindy's website because if nobody gets to see the pictures of Cindy, who cares? But we can't do it for real business. Excellent question. Kelp, the RAID concept works for standard hard drives, SSD hard drives, NVMe hard drives, and they're all used by different block storage forms. All drives. Good question, Kelp. Almighty. Is it okay to use RAID 5 in your private cloud? I'm using RAID 5 in my cloud, Al, and it works just fantastic. And the cloud provider is using RAID 5 or some flavor of it, and the block storage are giving you. So absolutely you can. Cloud hired and cat hired, yes. So do we all have some fun today? Everybody tell me if we had some fun. Type Azure Solution Architect Expert Training in there so that other people can find this free training. So that, that, that's a lot to type, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Azure Solution Architect Expert Training. <laughs> all right. Well, all right. If that's too much. So give me a day of a, of a cloud. Give me a hashtag cloud architect or a hashtag cloud engineer, whichever is the career of your dreams. 
please, 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 you're making sure that you get these free lab demos. I want you getting hands-on experience. But I wanted to do what I do with you guys, which is train architecture and engineering concepts so you know how stuff works, why it works, because you're all going to face some almighty interview. And on the interview, they're not going to say, can you configure this? But they are going to say, what do you need to use and how does it work? And I'm obsessed with getting you all cloud hired. That's my dream of getting you all cloud hired. That's everything to me of getting you all cloud hired. If you, my student or not, I still want to get you a get you cloud hired. Because it's what I do. I want everybody to be cloud hired. I do everything I can each day to try and reach out to you guys. I make a LinkedIn post. If you guys don't follow me on LinkedIn, please follow me on LinkedIn. I'll even give you the, the, if I can find the link to my profile, I'll do so so you guys know how to follow me. I'll pop it over in there. Almost every day I write things in leadership base to build your careers for free. Tonight, I mean it, please, please, please make sure you join us and listen to Daniel Bose's story. The whole point, the whole point of doing anything, just anything in any training is to enhance your career. That's the reason we do it. It's to enhance and improve everybody's career. So please join us tonight. My team will post a link to that session. Join us tonight. Make sure you join us next week for the BGP workshop. You guys are asking me about how to make sure how do we switch. Guess what? We do it for these reasons. We can do this all via many of these things via BGP. So there are so many, so many, so many ways that we can do this. And everybody, come and see Daniel tonight. You can see the link to it, a post I made on, on, uh, on LinkedIn this morning. You can see the show tonight. It's going to be at 6 p.m. Eastern, which admittedly is 11 o'clock in the U.K., 11 o'clock in Nigeria, 12 o'clock in Central Europe, or Cameroon time, but he's a special guy. He's 20, just turned 21, and he's now cloud hired, and he did it because he has special things about him. We worked through. We worked hard to get him hired, and he's hired, and I'm excited, and I want you to all see. So join us all tonight. I want to get you all hired. It looks like you guys are all having fun. I'm seeing the Azure Cloud stuff. Hopefully you guys access the free hands-on training and you sign up for the free BGP training next week and the free subnetting tra training next week. So we can give you as much as you can. Angelo, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to have you here. The hands-on labs are, yes, they are for you to download. That's what we've been asking you to download the whole time, the hands-on labs. They're in the chat they, box section. They, Please download them. They can't download them, Mike. They just access them on our website. Yeah, but what I mean is to sign. I'm sorry, please sign up and access the labs. You'll be accessing systems on our system. So let's make sure we have some party time, training time, party time. Anytime we can get better, party time, improve our career. Party time, improve our salary, party time, help others, party time. So hope you had a great time. Tonight, we're going to have fun. Make sure you join us for the show. Hear Daniel's story. Tomorrow morning from 9 to noon or 9 to 11, any kind of career questions you want to know how to get your job, I'll tell you how to get hired. Want to know what needs to be on your resume, I'll tell you how to get hired. Want to know the shortest path to get somewhere, I'll help you get hired. Want to be a cloud security architect? I'll help you. Want to be a cloud network architect? I'll help you. I'll tell you what you need to know, things you need to learn, the technologies you need to learn, the soft skills you need to learn, the leadership skills you need to learn, the sales skills, presentation. You tell me the career and I'll help you. I've been working in tech now for 25 years. I've spent two decades helping people get their first tech job or get promoted in tech, and I want to do it. So I hope you had a good time, Paul. I love that. I love to hear what we try and do is really teach you how it works to build your career. We try to say that we try to teach people a lot and we care about your success. So 
please give us a like, comment, subscribe. You know, I'm kind of hoping by the end of the day, we've got a little mini goal. We can reach a certain thing. Can you get us to 29,000? We're at 28,979. Can you get us to 29,000 before the end of the session by subscribing and hitting the bell? So hope you all had a great time. I actually post a link to my profile in LinkedIn, but I will post it again um, because there's lots of Michael Gibbses in Manchester, England. So uh, I will post it one more time in the chat. Please feel free to follow me. I post things related to cloud architect and cloud engineer careers every single day of the week. So hope you had a great time. Join us come tomorrow and take care, everyone. Get cloud hired. See you tomorrow.